Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to show you all everything you need to know to get started writing code in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you wouldn't mind, please like, comment, and subscribe. One like equals one prayer for the YouTube algorithm. I'm going to tell you why you need to learn C Sharp. C Sharp is a very flexible language. We can use C Sharp for all sorts of things console apps, web services, games, and if you're an aspiring game developer, C Sharp is definitely a language you want to learn, along with C++, but why not learn both? And the average salary for a C Sharp developer, if you have some experience, is $63,000 per year according to Glassdoor. If that all sounds good, let's begin. To code with C Sharp, we'll need an IDE. That's an integrated development environment. Think of it as software that helps us write other software. One that I would recommend is Visual Studio Community. So you can just Google that, then head to this URL at the top here. Okay, then we are going to download Visual Studio and just follow the installation procedures. So let's open this and run it. So continue. And here we have a bunch of different packages that we can download. You'll want to check .NET Desktop Development for using C Sharp. And if you're interested in using Unity, you might as well just download this package too. Then we are going to install. You have the option to sign in, but I'm just going to click not now, maybe later. You can also pick a color theme for your IDE. I'm going to go with dark because I like to feel like a pretend elite hacker. Then start Visual Studio. Now with this home screen, we'll continue without code. I'll show you all how we can create a new project. All right, now to create a new project, we'll go to File, New, Project. Select C Sharp Console Application. Next, we'll need a name for this project. I'll call this My First program next then create all right now this font size is very small you can either zoom in here down at the bottom or you can change the font as well as the font size by going to tools options environment fonts and colors and you can change the size here what about 18 and we should be good and here we have a small program that was created for us automatically all this does is display some output the words hello world to compile and run a program, you just have to click this green play button at the top. And this will create a console window that displays our output of hello world, whatever we have written here within quotes. And this line of code is known as the main method. It's the entry point for where our program begins. And this set of curly braces after the main method is the body of the main method. So our program will begin by executing any code at the top of the main method and it will work its way down and execute any subsequent code that follows. So this main method is made up of a bunch of words that we don't quite understand yet. Static, void, main, string, args. In time, we'll learn what each of these words mean, but that's more of an advanced topic. So a textbook that I read once said to think of the main method as like a magical spell or incantation that we have to say in order for our program to run. So let's see what happens if I remove the main method. I'll still keep this line though, console.write line, hello world, and let's try it. Okay, so it looks like there were build errors, so we cannot run the program as it is now. So we do need that main method, and if you are missing it, you can just type it in, and it should work now. Now this is a standard write line method. Whatever text that we put within quotes will appear within our console window to display as output. So let's actually change it. Right now it says hello world, but let's type something else. So make sure that this is within double quotes. Let's change this to, I like pizza. And then run this again. So now my output should say, I like pizza. And then you can add a second line of output just by writing console.writeline, then within parentheses and within double quotes, you can write something else like, it's really good. And now we have two lines of output. I like pizza, it's really good. So to write output to the console window, you type console.writeline, then within quotes, some text that you want to write. One thing that you may want to change is the font and the font size of your console window, because right now it's very difficult for me to read. So to change that, right click in the top left corner, go to properties, then go to font. Let's increase this to maybe 28. You can pick a new font style as well. I'll keep it the same. Then you can also change the color scheme too. I'll change the screen text to maybe green. Then, okay. All right, but now this window is huge, so let's change that. 
So again, go to the top left corner, go to properties, then go to layout. Let's change the width to what about, I don't know, 50 and the height to, let's say 15. I think that should be good. Okay, yeah, that's not too bad. And here it's actually a lot easier to read. I like pizza, it's really good. Oh, one last stupid thing that I wanted to show you all is how we can make our console beep type console dot beep parentheses semicolon. So then our program is going to beep when it reaches the end. It's not really important at all. I just thought it would be something fun to throw in at the end of this video. So that's how to make your console beep for some reason. All right, well, that's the very basics of C-sharp to get you started. In the next video, we'll cover more on output and comments. So I'll post this code to the comments section down below. And well, that's the very basics to get you started in C-sharp. Hey, you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. If you learned something new, then help me help you in three easy steps by smashing that like button, drop a comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to show you all a few different ways in which we can format output in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you find this video helpful, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Your support will help keep this channel running. All right, everybody, here's a few different ways in which we can format output in C Sharp. As we covered in the last video, to display something to our console window, we would type console.writeline, then you need a set of parentheses, then a semicolon at the end. You place your message within the parentheses. This is known as a method. And we have a semicolon at the end. The semicolon is kind of like the period at the end of a sentence. When we finish a statement in programming, we end it with a semicolon. So to display a message, within double quotes, you would type something. So this is known as a string literal. We're literally printing something to our console. So we kind of covered this in the last video. This will display the word hello. Now there's another way in which we can display output. That is just write. Console dot write parentheses semicolon. And within quotes, let's display something else. What about, hey. Now let's take a look at the difference between the two. All right, we have hey immediately followed by hello all in the same line. In the last video, we used two write line statements. Each string literal had their very own line. But in this case, it's all one line. So with right line, after you finish your string literal, it's going to hit enter, like we're hitting the enter key and we'll move down to a new line. Right doesn't do that. So you have two different ways in which you can display output to the console window, right and right line. Right does not hit the enter key after the end. It doesn't create a new line and right line does. So you can use either one depending on what you need. Now there is a shortcut to create a right line statement. You type C, then hit tab twice and that will auto-generate a write line statement for you. Okay, so the next topic to cover is comments. We can add a comment to our code, and this will not be displayed as output. So to write a comment within your code, you need two forward slashes, and you can see that the color of our text changed to green. So I'm going to type, this is a comment, and this has no effect on our output. This comment will not be seen. All we see here is, hey and hello. You can also write a multi-line comment. You would type forward slash asterisk. This is a multi-line comment. Then to end a multi-line comment, you would end it with asterisk, then forward slash again. And last but not least, we have escape sequences. We can add an escape sequence to a string to format our output. So let's create a right line statement and type whatever your name is. Okay, now to create an escape sequence, we need to add a backslash followed by a certain character. Depending on what character you select, it's going to have a special effect on your string. So if I typed backslash T, that will add a tab escape sequence before displaying my name. All right, so we have a tab before my string. So let's change this to maybe a backspace. I'll add that here. So backslash B, that will add a backspace. 
and my name is now BR code. All right, so we can also do new line, backslash n for new line. So my first name is on one line and my last name is on a second line. Now you may have noticed that there's all this garbage at the end of my console window when my program is done running. So one way in which we can hide that at the end of our program type console.read key. So basically this will prevent our program from ending until we type a key. And it should be hidden now. So if I hit the enter key, well then my program is going to finish running. All right, everybody. So those are a few ways in which we can format output in C sharp. If you can give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below. And well, those are a few ways to format output in C sharp. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your bro. Hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to explain variables in C sharp. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Do you all remember back in middle school when we learned about algebra, we had to solve an equation to find the value of x, and x is some representation of a number? Well, with programming, we can create our own variables, but we are not limited to just numbers. We can store characters, words, and even these things called booleans, which are either true or false. So I'm going to show you all how we can create our own variables in C Sharp. Creating a variable takes two steps, declaration and initialization. To create a variable, we first have to declare what type of data we'll be storing. If we need to store a number, we'll type int short for integer, and we'll need a unique name for this specific variable. So let's just call this x, and then end the statement with a semicolon, because with programming, semicolons are kind of like periods when you finish a sentence. Okay, so this step was declaration, and I'll just add a note here. So this step is declaration. And now to assign a value, we will initialize this variable. So to assign this variable x a value type x equals and then some value, let's say one, two, three, then semicolon. OK, so we now have a variable named x and this step is initialization. Now you can combine these two steps. So to do that, we would say int, let's say y this time equals three, two, one semicolon. So we have two variables, x and y. So this step right here is both declaration and initialization. Now these variables behave as the value that they contain. So let's display some of these. So within a console dot right line statement, I'm going to display x. And then with a second right line statement, I will display y. So console dot right line y. And we have one, two, three, three, two, one. Now you can use these for like math too. We could say like int z equals x plus y and then display whatever z is. Console.writeline z. And the result is 444. So these names for these variables really aren't descriptive, x, y, and z. We can give some more unique names that describe what kind of value that these variables contain. So let's say int age, and I'll assign this variable age a value of 21. And then I can display my age within a right line statement or use it for something. So let's say console dot right line. And then I can display a message along with my age. So let's say your age is. So this part is within quotes to display the value of my age. I will add plus age. Make sure age is not within quotes because then we're printing a string literal and not the value contained within age. So this should display your age is 21. So there's more data types than just int. This time, let's use a double. A double is really just a decimal number. It's like a floating point number, but with more precision. There are floats in C sharp, but I don't really think they're that important for beginners. So with a double, we can store a decimal number and int only stores a whole integer. So if I try to display like 21.5 and then display it, this is what happens. So we'll run into a build error. So with int, we can only store whole integers, but with a double, we can store something that includes a decimal. So let's say we have a double height and I'll assign this a perfectly average height of 
centimeters, I guess. And now since this variable is initialized, we can use it for something. We can change the value or we can use it within a message. So let's use console.writeLine and I'll display my height within some sort of message. Let's say your height is space plus height plus another string. Let's say cm four centimeters. Then let's try it. Okay, your age is 21. Your height is 300.5 centimeters. So a double variable can store a decimal number. Unlike with integers, they only store whole numbers. Now the next data type is Boolean, and to declare a Boolean variable, we type bool, then a variable name. So Booleans can only store true or false. So this might be good if you need something that only has like two options, like a light switch, it's on or it's off. If somebody's online, that could be true. If they're offline, that's false. Or maybe somebody is alive. Let's say bool alive, either true or false. But the last time I checked, I am alive, so I'm going to say that is true. And then we can use this Boolean variable for something. So let's use this within a console.writeLine statement. Console.writeLine. And what should we say? Are you alive? Plus alive. Are you alive? That is true. So if I change this to false, this would display, are you alive? That is false. So that is a Boolean variable. It's only true or false. So for practice, I'll encourage you to try and type something besides true or false, like the word pizza. We can't shove a whole pizza into a Boolean variable. It can only be true or false. So let's change that back. Okay, the next data type is char. It's a character, a single character. What about symbol, char symbol, and we need to place this within single quotes. So let's say our character is the at sign, and then let's display it. Console.writeLine, your symbol is plus symbol. Your symbol is at sign, so make sure that this is within single quotes when you assign a value. So with chars, we can only assign a single character if I attempted to add like a different symbol too. Well, this wouldn't work then. See, we're getting an error here. So that's where strings come in. With a string, we can store a series of characters. And to declare this, we type string with a capital S. String, let's say name, string name. And this value is within double quotes. So type whatever your first name is, and then we can use our name for something. Let's display a message that says, hello, whatever your name is. Console.writeLine, hello, plus name. Okay, hello, bro. Your age is 21. Your height is 300.5 centimeters. Are you alive? False. Your symbol is at sign. Let's say that we have a username. And I'll say string username equals symbol plus name. And then I'll display this console.writeLine. Your user name is colon space quotes plus user name whatever you typed here. Okay, your username is at bro. Those are variables. They're containers for values, but you can store more than just numbers. You can store Boolean values, characters, and strings. And a string is a series of characters. So if you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. And well, those are variables in C Sharp. Okay, it looks like we're on constants. Constants are immutable values which are known at compile time and do not change for the life of a program. 
Let's say that we have a double variable named pi, and this equals the first few digits of pi, 3.14159. If this is not a constant, people can actually change the value contained within this variable, and that could be a security concern. Let's say pi now equals 420, and then I will display the value contained within pi. So if you do not want people to be able to change this value, we can precede the data type of this variable with the const keyword, and this variable is now a constant, and we can't update this variable now that it's a constant. So yeah, that's a constant. It's an immutable value which is known at compile time and does not change for the life of the program, and it adds a little bit of security to our programs because people cannot later change these values. So yeah, those are constants in C Sharp. Oh yeah. Typecasting. Typecasting is the ability to convert a value to a different data type. It's useful when we accept user input because when the user types in something, it's going to be a string, and strings can only do so many things, and different data types can perform different things, so it may be necessary to convert from one data type to another. Like for example, we can't use strings for any sort of math, we would need to convert a string to an integer or a double to be able to use a string representation of a number. So let's begin. Let's say we would like to convert a double to an integer. Let's create a double variable named a, and I'll assign this a value of 3.14, the first few digits of pi. So what we could do if we wanted to convert this number to an int, we could store this within a separate variable. Let's say int b equals, now to convert this value to an integer, we can use the convert classes to int 32 method. So convert dot to int 32 parentheses semicolon. And within the parentheses, I'm going to place what I want to convert. I'm going to convert the value stored within A and then assign it to variable B. And then let's display this variable with a right line statement. So console dot right line, and then I will display whatever B is. Then let's try it. And the value stored within B is three. So if we convert a double to an integer, it's going to truncate any decimal portion if there is any. So since we wrote this program this way, it's not going to get rid of the value within A. So if I were to display A, it's going to be 3.14. All we did is that we took the value stored within A and created a copy of it, then converted it to an integer and stored it within B. It's also possible to display the data type of whatever variable that we're working with. So after a within our right line method, type dot get type, then add a set of parentheses. This is the get type method. So this will display instead of the value stored within a, it's going to display the data type of whatever a is. So the data type of a is currently a double. Now let's change this to b, b dot get type. And our variable b is an integer int 32. So if you need the data type of a variable, follow that variable with dot get type, then a set of parentheses. This is a built in method of variables. Let's convert an int to double this time. Let's create int c equals what about one, two, three? And we'll create double d equals convert dot to double then parentheses, semicolon, within the parentheses, we will convert C, so place that within there, and within a right line statement, we will display whatever D is, console.writeline D. So if your double doesn't contain like a decimal portion, it's not going to display like 0, .0. but if I were to add like 0 0.1 to the end of this, then it will display a decimal portion. So 123.1, and the data type of D, let's follow this with the get type method. So the data type of D is in fact a double. Okay, now let's convert an integer to a string. We'll need int, what about E? E equals three to one, and I'll create string F equals convert dot to string. Are you beginning to see a pattern here? then parentheses, semicolon, then pass in E. So place that within the parentheses, and we will display whatever F is. Console dot right line, the value stored within F. And that will be 321. 
So a string we can't use for any arithmetic, but with ints and doubles we can. So if we convert an integer to a string, we can no longer use this for any math. But if we converted a string to an integer, then we can use it for any sort of math. So let's follow this with get type method f dot get type. And the data type of f is in fact a string. Okay, exercise number three. Let's convert a string to a char. A char is just a single character. String g equals, so a string is always within double quotes. What about the dollar sign? And a char is always within single quotes. We treat strings and chars differently. You can store a single character within a string. However, strings are different from chars. There's different things that we can do. So let's say char, what comes after g? E, F, G, H. Char h equals convert dot to char. Then of course, parentheses, semicolon. Within the parentheses, we will place g. And then display whatever h is. So console dot right line h. So h will still be a dollar sign, but we treat it different because it's a character. There's different things that we can do. Then let's get the type of whatever h is. And h is a char, a single character. Okay, last but not least, let's convert a string to a boolean. String i equals true within double quotes. So this is different from true without double quotes because this is a boolean and right now we're getting an error. So it represents a boolean true or false. A string is always within double quotes. So we would treat this string different from this boolean even though they say the same thing. Okay, then let's convert this string to a boolean. Type bool, not cool. Bool j equals convert dot to boolean parentheses semicolon pass in i then we will display whatever j is console dot right line j and this will display true then let's get the type of this variable so j dot get type method and the data type of j is a boolean now all right, everybody, so that's how to typecast. We can convert a value to a different data type, and it's really useful when we accept user input because it's always going to be a string. And there's different things that we can do with different data types, so it may be necessary to convert from one data type to another. So if you would like a copy of all this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. And well, that's typecasting in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's you bro. Hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to show you all how we can accept some user input in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, here's how we can accept some user input. Now, when we do accept user input, it's of the string data type. So let's create a variable to hold and store our input. Let's create a variable named name, and we will ask the user for what their name is. Now to read some user input, type console.readLine, then parentheses, semicolon. So when the user types in something, then hits enter, we will take that user input and store it within this variable name, which we can then use for something. So within a right line statement, let's use the user's name for something. Hello plus name. And let's take a look. Okay, now to enter in some user input, we'll have to type this into the console directly. However, it is good practice to let the user know what we want them to type in exactly because how's the user supposed to know that they're supposed to type in their name right here? So what we'll do is preceding our read line statement, let's create a prompt to tell the user what we want them to type in. So within a write line statement, let's say, what's your name? And then try this again. Okay, what's your name? Now the user knows that they have to type in their name. So type in your first name, hit enter, hello, whatever your first name is. Okay, this time let's accept a user's age and then we'll typecast the user's age into an integer variable. So let's copy what we have, paste it, console.writeline, what's your age? And we'll create a new variable of the int data type named age. 
Now we'll need to cast this user input into an integer. So to do that, we would type convert dot two int 32 parentheses semicolon. Now take this statement without the semicolon, cut it, and then paste it within the parentheses. So what we're doing is accepting some user input, then converting it to an integer that we're storing within this variable age. And then we will display the user's age. Console dot write line u r plus age plus years old. Then let's run this again. So our program is actually going to wait at each prompt until the user types something in. So what's your name, bro? Let's say that I'm 21, I'll hit enter. Hello, bro, you are 21 years old. Now, one issue that you may run into is if the user types in something that's non-numeric and we try and convert it. So let's try this again. What's your name, bro? And instead of an age, what if I type in a word like pizza? This will cause an exception. An exception will interrupt our program and this specific exception is a format exception. Input string was not in a correct format, so there will be a future video on handling exceptions, which will prevent the program from pausing and being interrupted, but that's a future video. In the meantime, we'll just have to be sure that we're entering in the correct user input. Well, okay then everybody, that's how to accept some user input in C Sharp. I will post this code to the comments section down below, and well, yeah, that's how to accept user input in C Sharp. Hey everyone, we're going to cover some basic arithmetic in C Sharp, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, I thought we could just cover some basic arithmetic real quick. Let's say we have a variable friends, and I will assign this a value of, what about five? And within a right line statement, I will display the value stored within friends. So of course, friends will have a value of five. But what if I need to update this, like increment it? I could say friends equals friends, and we make a friend, so we could say friends equals friends plus one, because remember the value stored within friends is five. This is no different from saying friends equals five plus one, which would be six. So let me display the value stored within friends, and of course that's six. Of course, you can change this to a different number too. You could say friends equals friends plus two, then the amount of friends that we have is seven. So there is a shortcut of writing this too because this can be somewhat tedious. What you could say is friends plus equals then the amount that you want to increment this variable by. So if I need to increment friends by two, I could say friends plus equals two, and that would do the same thing. That's like a shortcut. So of course that would be seven. So there's a third way to increment and decrement too. This method is found within loops. You could say friends plus plus. However, this will only increment a variable by one. So if friends is initially five, then we say plus plus, well then friends will equal six. So there's three different ways to increment a variable. This way is found within loops. This is the standard way, and that's kind of the shortcut, this line right here. Okay, so let's decrement friends. So we could say friends equals friends minus one, or we could say friends minus equals one, or friends minus minus. So if we combine all of these, the amount of friends that we have is two. Let's work on some multiplication. If we need to double the amount of friends that we have, we would say friends equals friends times, we use an asterisk for multiplication and programming, times two. Then the amount of friends that we have is 10. And the shortcut would be friends asterisk equals two and that would do the same thing. Now division, let's say that Steve breaks up our group of friends. So we could say friends equals friends divided by two and for division we use a forward slash. Now pay attention to this. Our current number of friends is five, but what if we divide this by two? Well, you would think that we get 2.5, right? Well, you're wrong, we end up with two. That's because friends is an integer. We can only store whole numbers. We can't store that decimal portion, that 0.5. So if this was a double, well then that would be 2.5. So that's referred to as integer division and that's something you have to look out for. So if friends equals friends divided by two, well then the shortcut would be friends forward slash equals two and that would do the same thing. And then remember I'm storing this within an integer so we will truncate that decimal portion and we end up with two.
And our last operator for this topic is the modulus, also known as the remainder operator. Now for this example, I'm going to change the amount of friends that we have to 10. So we can find the remainder of any division, but I'm going to store this within a new variable, int remainder. And to find the remainder, we could say friends, then modulus, which is represented by a percent sign, then three. So 10 divided by three will have a remainder and we will store that remainder within a new variable. So let's pretend that we have a total of 10 people and we have to break up into groups of three. So there's going to be one person remaining and I will just display that remainder of one. But if this was in groups of two, so friends modulus two, well, 10 divides by two evenly, so there will be no remainder and the value will be zero. So if you need to find the remainder, you can always use this modulus, the remainder operator. And it's also pretty good for finding if numbers are even or odd too. So that's always a plus as well. All right, everybody. So that is some basic arithmetic. I will post this code in the comment section down below. And well, that's some basic arithmetic in C sharp. Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna show you all a few useful methods of the math class. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, everybody. So here's a few useful methods of the math class that you might be interested in. Let's begin with creating a double variable named x, and I'll assign a value of three. Now, the first useful method is the pow method. That will raise a value to a certain power, and we'll store this within a new variable. Let's say a double a equals, then to access the math class, type math with a capital M dot and here's a whole bunch of methods they have access to. So we are looking for the pow method right here. Then add a set of parentheses, semicolon. Now within the parentheses, the first value is your base. So the base will be x and that is three. And what power do we want to raise x to? Let's raise x to the second power and then display whatever our result is a. So within a right line statement, I'm going to display a. So here is the result. Three to the power of two is Drum roll, please. Nine. So if we need three to the power of three, that would be, you know, x, whatever you're working with, that's the base, comma, three. So three to the power of three is 27. Okay, let's try square root. I'll turn this line into a comment and we'll create double b equals, then again, to access methods from the math class, type math with a capital M dot, and we are looking for square root. That is all the way down here. S Q R T parentheses, semicolon within the parentheses, we will find the square root of X and then store it within B. Console dot right line B. And that would be 1.73 something, 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 something. So that is the square root method. Let's move on. Let's create a double C and we'll find the absolute value of X. So math dot A B S. So the absolute value is how far away something is from zero. So if you have a negative number like negative three, well, it's going to turn that into a positive number. So the absolute value of negative three, oh, we need to display C. So the absolute value of negative three is in fact three. So that is the absolute value method. Let's move on, rounding. So double, let's see, we're on D, equals math dot round, and we can round a number. Pay attention to the capitalization too. Okay, now let's change X to 3.14, and then we will round X. So place that within the parentheses of the round method, and we will display D. And 3.14 rounded is three. Now you can always round a number up by using the ceiling method. Let's create double E equals math dot ceiling. All right, then we will place X within this method and display E. So 3.14 rounded up using the ceiling method is four. Alternatively, there is a floor method that will always round down. And I'm just going to copy this. So double F math dot floor. And let's change this to 3.99 and display F. 
So 3.99 rounded down is 3. Okay, now we'll need two variables for this next example. So let's create double y equals, what about 5? Okay, so we have the max method. We can find the maximum value of two values or variables. So double g equals math dot max. And within the parentheses, we want to compare x and y and separate each of these with a comma. So this will find the max between x and y and store the maximum number within g. And then we should display g. So the maximum between x and y is y, and that contains 5. Then we have min. So double h math dot min console dot right line h so the minimum between x and y is x 3.99 all right everybody so those are a few useful methods of the math class i will post this code to the comment section down below and well yeah those are a few useful methods of the math class hey what's going on everybody it's your bro hope you're doing well and in this video i'm going to explain how we can generate some random numbers in c sharp so sit back relax and enjoy the show all right people here's how to generate some random numbers just so you know these are not true random numbers but rather pseudo random numbers and they're fairly darn close so to create some random numbers we'll need to instantiate a random object type random with an uppercase r random with a lowercase r equals new random parentheses semicolon so the name of our random object is random really you could have named this anything but i usually just call it random and we can use this object to generate random numbers and there's a few built-in methods of this random object to access them add a dot and we'll focus on the next method and next double method next we'll generate a random whole integer so we'll want to specify a range this by itself will generate a random number between i believe zero and just over two billion so we'll probably want to set a range let's pretend that we're rolling a six-sided dice i need a random number between one and six so i can set that range within the parentheses so the minimum would be one comma and the max would be technically seven because the second number is going to be exclusive so this will give us a random number between one and six just specify the range and we'll store this within a variable int num equals random dot next a random number between one and six all right then let's display this console dot right line num and we should have a random number between one and six and we got six all right then you can always make adjustments to this too like you can add i don't know 100 and that should give us a number between 101 and 106 so that's always an option too okay now what if you need to roll a 20-sided dice like we're playing dungeons and dragons we use polyhedral dice so that would be 1 comma 21 and this will give us a random number between 1 and 20 and we rolled an 8. now there is a next double method which will generate a random decimal number so let's say double num equals random dot next double and the random number will be between 0 and 1. So we have 0 0.7016 something 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 something. So if you need a random decimal or random double number, you can use random.next double. Otherwise, if you need a random whole integer, you're better off using the next method of random. Now, if you need, let's say, three random numbers, we can keep on reusing the same random object. We only need to instantiate it once. Let's say we're going to roll three dice. So three six-sided dice. Let's copy what we have and paste it twice. So we have num1, num2, num3. Then let's display these. Console.writeline num1, num2, and num3. So we will have three random numbers. And the result is three, six, and four. Well, okay then everybody, that is how to generate random numbers in C Sharp. I will post this code to the comment section down below. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below. And well, that's how to generate random numbers in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on people? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, we're going to create a small program to find the hypotenuse of a right triangle in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. 
Hey everyone, I thought for practice we could create a small program to find the hypotenuse of a right triangle. This will be more or less just for practice. So we'll need some prompts. Let's ask for sides A and B. Let's begin with A. Enter side A. And then we'll store the user's input within a double. Double A equals, and we'll convert the user input to a double. Convert to double then within the parentheses, console.read line. Then another set of parentheses. Make sure there is a semicolon at the end too. Okay, then for side B, we can just copy what we have, change any instance of A to B. Enter side B, double B. And we'll have to calculate whatever C is. Double C, math dot square root. Then we need to multiply a times a that's effectively a to the power of two plus b times b and let's display the result console dot right line the hypotenuse is plus c and let's give it a go Okay, enter side A, how about three? Enter side B, four, the hypotenuse is five. Well, everybody, that was a very small practice program. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below. And well, that is a very small sample program in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well, and in this video I'm gonna show you all some useful string methods in C-sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right everybody, here's a few useful string methods that you may be interested in. So to begin, we'll need a string to work with or a variable containing a string. So why don't we create a variable named full name to store your own full name? Now to access some methods available to strings, we'll need to type a string or a variable containing a string, then follow this with a dot. And there should be a prompt for a whole bunch of methods that we have access to. I'll show you some of the more useful ones like to upper, full name dot to upper, then to invoke this, add a set of parentheses, then a semicolon to finish the statement. But then we'll need to reassign this. Full name equals full name to upper then we can display our full name. And when I run this, my name should all be uppercase. Just like that. Okay, now, alternatively, there's to lower. It's the same process as before, but change the method to lower. And my name should all be lowercase. Okay, so that's to upper and to lower. Let's move on. For this next example, we'll need a phone number. So let's create a string named phone number equals and make up some phone number and be sure to include some dashes one two three four five six seven eight nine zero okay what i'm going to do is replace these dashes with a different character so to do that we'll need to use the replace method so phone number dot replace so within the set of parentheses we'll need the character we're going to replace and another character we're going to replace the old character with so I would like to replace all dashes with a forward slash. So separate each of these characters with a comma. So this will replace my phone number, the dashes within the phone number with forward slashes. Phone number equals phone number dot replace. And let's display our phone number with a right line statement. So all of these dashes have been replaced with forward slashes. Now, if you replace these with no characters, just an empty set of quotes, that will effectively remove those dashes within the phone number, which could have some uses too. So that is the replace method available to strings. Next, we have the insert method. We can insert a character or a string at a given index within a pre-existing string. Let's say I would like to take my full name and turn it into some sort of username by preceding my first name with the at sign. So to do that, I can use the insert method. I'll create a new variable for this example. Let's say string username equals full name dot insert. And with the insert method, we will list an index and what we would like to insert. 
So computers, they always start at zero. The beginning would be zero. That would be the first index. So at the beginning, index zero, I would like to insert an at sign. And this will create a new variable called username. So I will display that within a right line statement, console.writeline username. And my username is now at whatever my full name was. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be a single character. We could say like Mr. Dot and precede my full name with Mr. And my username is now Mr. Brocode. Okay, so that is the insert method. What I'm about to show you next technically isn't a method, it's a property, but it's found within the same place as methods for strings. So to access the length property of a string, type a string dot length, and you do not add a set of parentheses afterwards. That is done with methods. So the length property will return the given amount of characters within a string. So I'm going to display this within a right line statement. If you need this, you can always like assign this to a variable or something but that might be overkill for this lesson. So console.writeline the length of my full name, and my full name has eight characters in it. One potential use of the length property of strings is that, let's say that somebody's creating a username and there's a max 12 characters. Well, you can get the length of whatever they type in and check to see if it's more than 12 characters. This next method is the substring method, and it can be a little complex. Basically speaking, we can take a section from an original string and create an entirely new string, but we have to specify a position and how many characters you would like to extract from that given position. So we'll create two new strings from full name, first name and last name using the substring method. So let's declare string first name equals full name dot substring. Okay, so within the substring, we're going to list an index and the amount of characters afterwards we would like to include within our substring. So I would like to take the first three characters from my full name. So the index, computers always start with zero, up at the beginning of my string would be zero, and I'm going to take three characters after this index. So if I was to display my first name now, it's going to be, bro, the first three characters of my full name. Now let's do the same thing with last name. So let's copy what we have change first name to last name, but now we have a different index. So I would like my substring to begin where the C is. So let's count what the index is going to be. This would be zero, one, two, three, four. So let's change zero to four. And how many characters would we like to include within our substring? One, two, three, four. So four comma four, and that is my last name. So I will display that within a right line statement first name and last name. So that is the substring method. We can take a section or a slice from an original string and create an entirely new string from it. All right, everybody, those are a few useful string methods, but not all of them. So if you would like a complete list, you can always type a string dot, and there should be a pop-up for all of the different string methods you can access. And if you highlight one of these, there's a description of what they do exactly. I only showed you a few of the more useful ones for beginners. So if you can, give this video a big fat thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and well, those are some useful string methods in C Sharp. All right, people, if statements. An if statement is a basic form of decision making. If some condition that we specify is true, we can execute a block of code. If it's not true, we can do something else entirely. So let's write a small program where we will ask a user to enter in their age. And depending on their age, we can write an if statement that checks to see if somebody is 18 years or older. Let's say that a user is signing up for a credit card and you have to be 18 years or older. So if their age is greater than or equal to 18, we will display a message that says, you're now signed up. If they're less than 18, we can do something else. So to write an if statement, we just write if then parentheses to hold some sort of condition, which we would like to evaluate, followed by a set of parentheses. So if some condition that we set within the parentheses is true, we will execute this block of code. If it's not true, we skip over it entirely. So let's check to see if age is greater than or equal to 18. Then we will display something. Console.writeline, you are now signed up. And let's try it. 
Please enter your age. Let's say that I'm 21. I hit enter. Boom, you are now signed up. Now, what if I enter in an age that's less than 18? Let's say that I'm 12 years old and I'm trying to sign up for a credit card. Well, nothing appears to happen and that's normal. So if this condition evaluates to be true, we execute this block of code. If it's false, we skip over it entirely as if it never existed. Now we can take a different course of action. If our above condition is false, we can perform some other block of code. So let's display a message that says you must be 18 years or older to sign up. You must be 18 plus to sign up. So if this condition is true, we do this. If it's false, we do this. So let's try it again. Please enter your age. Let's say that I'm 12, I hit enter. You must be 18 plus to sign up. So if this is true, do this. If it's not true, do this. Now, between the if and else statements, you can add an else if statement if there's more things that you want to check before reaching the else block. So the else block is kind of like a last resort if all of above statements evaluate to be false. Let's check to see if somebody's age is less than zero. Else if age is less than zero, then we will display a custom message such as you haven't been born yet. Please enter your age. I am negative 12 years old. You haven't been born yet. With these else if statements, you can add as many as you want between if and else. Let's add another. So I will copy what we have. Let's check to see if somebody's age is greater than 100. If it is, then we'll say, I don't know, you're too old to sign up. That's kind of mean, I guess, but it serves the purpose of this example. So you are too old to sign up. Now we're going to run into one issue. Okay, please enter your age. I am 101 years old. You are now signed up. Now, the reason that this block of code executed and not this one is that we're just going down in order starting from the top. Since age, which was 101, is technically greater than or equal to 18, this condition evaluated to be true, and we executed this block of code and skipped everything else after it and continued on with the rest of the program. So if we first want to check to see if somebody's age is greater than 100, we should probably put that within the if statement and check that first. Because age is technically greater than or equal to 18 if we set age to be 101. Else if, we will check to see if age is greater than or equal to 18. Then we just have to change these lines of text around. So you are too old to sign up. So the order of these if statements and else if statements does matter. And let's try it again. Okay, please enter your age. I am 101 years old. You are too old to sign up. All right, now in this next example, let's ask a user for their name instead of their age. Let's change int age to string name. And we do not need to convert this because it's already a string. So to check to see if somebody does not enter in some user input, we can check to see if our variable name equals an empty set of quotes. So this is an empty string. Now, the reason that we're using two equal signs is that this is a comparison operator. If you just use one, that is an assignment operator. C Sharp thinks you're attempting to assign name with an empty string. So we're comparing if these two are equal. So that's why we use double equals. So if name is equal to an empty string, that means that somebody skipped over entering in some user input. So let's yell at them. You did not enter your name. So if our name is not empty, we can display maybe hello, whatever the user's name is. So hello plus name. And let's try it. Okay, please enter your name. I'm just going to hit enter. You did not enter your name. Let's run this again and take it seriously this time. Please enter your name, bro. Hello, bro. Now there's another way in which we could write this. So instead of using this double equal sign, we can use exclamation point equal sign. That means not equals. If name does not equal an empty string, then we will display hello name. Else, we will display you did not enter your name. So we're checking to see if name is not equal to an empty string. And if that's true, display hello name. Okay, please enter your name. I'll hit enter. You did not enter your name. Let's try it again. Please enter your name, bro, hello, bro. All right, everybody, those are if statements. They're a very basic form of decision making. We can check to see if some condition is true. If it is true, then we can do something. If not, we can do something else.
So if you would like a copy of both examples from this video, I will post that code to the comment section down below. And well, those are if statements in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to explain switches in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, everybody, switches. A switch is an efficient alternative to writing many else if statements. I wrote a small program. We'll ask a user, what day is it today like, what day of the week? And we'll store their input within a variable named day. If day equals Monday, we'll write, it's Monday. And we have else if statements for every day of the week that follows after. And an else block at the end. Day is not a day if they type in something that's obviously not a day. Using else if statements back to back like this really isn't that efficient. And if a veteran programmer sees you do something like this, they'll probably call you a noob. A few else if statements is okay, but this is somewhat excessive. So let's rewrite this program so that we use a switch instead. Here's how to create one. We'll keep our prompt too. So switch, parentheses, curly braces. Within the parentheses, we will place what we would like to examine. We will examine our day variable against many cases. And if there is a match, then we will execute some block of code. So to write a case, write case then some value like Monday, then end this with a colon. So anything indented after our case is part of the block of code for this case. So if we have a match, if day equals case Monday, then let's write it's Monday. Then on the next line, add break to exit the switch. Okay, so that's one case. Let's write a case for each day of the week and I'll just fast forward this footage. And our switch is now complete, although I did not add that line from the else statement quite yet. We'll take care of that a little bit later. So let's run this just to test it. So what day is it today? Let's say that it's Sunday. Enter. It's Sunday. Nice. One thing that we're missing, although it's optional, is a default case. If there's no matches, what do we want to do? So currently there is no default case within the switch. So what day is it today? If I write something incorrect like pizza, well, the switch technically doesn't do anything. So if there are no matching cases, let's do something. And we type default colon space. If there are no matching cases, we will perform this block of code at the end. So let's write something. Day plus is not a day. And then break. And let's try it again. So this is kind of like our else statement. Okay, what day is it today? This time, let's say it's birthday. Birthday is not a day. All right, everybody, those are switches. They're efficient alternatives to using many else if statements. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and those are switches in C Sharp. All right, logical operators. We can use logical operators to check to see if more than one condition is true or false. We'll use two logical operators, and as well as or. And is represented by two ampersands, and or is represented by two vertical bars. We'll create a small program to ask the user what the temperature is outside, and depending on what the user types in, we'll display a custom message. So we'll need to work with ranges of temperatures. So let's begin. We'll ask the user for some input. So console.writeline, what's the temperature outside? And you can write this in Fahrenheit or Celsius, but I'll use Celsius. Okay, then we'll store our input within a double variable named temp, short for temperature. And we'll need to use console.readLine. And then we'll need to convert this to a double using convert.toDouble method. So convert.toDouble. Then within the parentheses, place your readLine method within here. Okay. Now we need to check to see if our temperature falls within a certain range using an if statement and using the and logical operator that will help us with that. So let's check to see if our temp is greater than or equal to 10 degrees Celsius. And if our temperature is less than or equal to what about 25? So both of these conditions must be true in order for us to execute this if statement. If one of them is false, we will skip over this if statement. So this condition needs to be true and this condition needs to be true. 
So our temperature has to fall within that range. So we will display a custom message like it's warm outside. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's just warm. And let's try it. Okay, so what if the temperature was like 35 degrees Celsius? Well, nothing appears to happen. We did not execute this if statement. Even though this condition is true, this condition must also be true because we're using the and logical operator. So let's try this again and type in a temperature between that range. What's the temperature outside? Let's say that it's 15 degrees Celsius. It's warm outside. Now, using the or logical operator, only one of these conditions needs to be true in order for this entire expression to evaluate to be true. Unlike with the and logical operator, both conditions must be true. So let's check for some extreme temperatures using an else if statement. Else if temp, let's say, is less than or equal to negative 50, or temp is greater than or equal to 50, then we will display do not go outside. Let's try it. Okay, what's the temperature outside? Let's say that it's negative 52 degrees Celsius. Do not go outside. So even though this condition is true and this one is false, using the or logical operator, only one of these conditions needs to be true in order for our entire expression to evaluate to be true. So let's do the same thing with a very high temperature this time. What's the temperature outside? Let's say that it's like a kajillion degrees Celsius. Maybe our sun explodes or something. Do not go outside. Well, okay then everybody, those are logical operators. We can use them to check to see if more than one condition is true or false. So if you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. And well, those are logical operators in C Sharp. All right, while loops. A while loop will repeat some code while some condition remains true. We'll write a small program where we will ask a user to enter in their name. If they do not enter in anything, we will keep on prompting them to enter their name. They have to enter something in order to escape the loop. So this is what we'll do to begin with. Let's create a prompt to ask a user for their name. I'll use a write statement instead of a write line statement. And let's say, enter your name. And then we will declare a string variable named name console.readline and then store that within variable name. And then at the end of our program, we'll say hello plus name. Okay, so after running this, what if a user doesn't type in anything, like they just hit enter? Hello, and then there's nothing here. So what if we try and force the user to enter in something? We can write this code within a while loop. So after we accept user input for the first time, let's check that user input and we'll use a while loop. Our condition will be while name is equal to an empty string. We will prompt the user again to enter in something for their name. And we do not need to declare name twice. Name equals console.readline. So let's try this again. Our condition is we will continue this while loop, this section of code, as long as name equals an empty string if they just hit enter. So let's try it. Okay, enter your name, I'm going to hit enter. Enter your name, no. Enter your name, no. Enter your name, no. Okay, I'll type in something. Hello, bro. So with a while loop, you'll need some way to eventually exit the while loop. Otherwise, that is known as an infinite loop. And here's an example of an infinite loop. I'm going to say while one is equal to one. And then let's display something else such as help. I'm stuck in an infinite loop. So basically we have no way to change this condition, so it's always going to be true. And we will repeat this code forever. So let's try it again. Okay, onto your name. Help, I'm stuck in an infinite loop. So with a while loop, you'll eventually want some way to eventually exit the while loop. Now to optimize this code, we don't technically need this write statement here because we will ask that within the while loop. And I'm going to declare string name and assign this an empty string. So this would work the same as before as well. So enter your name, I do not type in anything, and we are prompted again to type in our name. And I'll type in something. Well, okay then everybody, those are while loops. They will repeat some code while some condition remains true. 
and it will do so infinitely until this condition becomes false. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and well, those are while loops in C Sharp. Okay, for loops. A for loop will repeat some code a finite amount of times. Unlike with while loops, a while loop will execute an infinite amount of times as long as its condition remains true. For loops are limited. So let's create a for loop to, I don't know, count to 10. So let's create a for loop by typing for parentheses curly braces. And within the for loop, the parentheses of the for loop, there's three separate statements we're going to fill in. The first is that we need some sort of counter or index to keep track of which iteration we're on within the for loop. So let's declare an index int index, and I will assign zero to begin with. So people usually just shorten index to simply I for short. So that is the first statement. The second statement is our condition. When do we want to stop? So let's stop when I is greater than or equal to 10. So we'll just say I is less than 10. So it's kind of like we'll continue this for loop as long as I is less than 10. And once we hit 10, we'll stop. And then the third statement is how much do we want to increment or decrement our index by? So you can write I plus equals one to increment by one, or another variation is just I plus plus. So after each iteration, we'll increment I, our counter, our index by one. And during each iteration, let's display whatever I is. So after running this code, we will execute this for loop 10 times, and we will count the numbers zero through nine. So if we want one through 10, we can change our index to one, int I equals one, and we will continue this for loop as long as i is less than or equal to 10. And then our for loop will execute a total of 10 times and count the numbers 1 through 10. And you can also skip iterations too, like we can increment our index i by 2. i plus equals 2. Now this for loop is going to execute 5 times. We're incrementing our index by 2 during each iteration. Let's change this to three, i plus equals three. And this will execute four times, one, four, seven, 10. Okay, let's do something a little bit different. Let's count down. Let's pretend that we're counting down to a new year. So we'll start at 10 and count down to one, then display happy new year. So four parentheses, curly braces, we'll set index i to equal 10 to begin with. We'll continue this as long as i is greater than zero, then we will decrement i by one during each iteration. So you can use minus minus or minus equals one. Either variation works. Okay, so after each iteration, we will display i, then when we exit our for loop, we will display happy new year within a right line statement. So happy new year. Let's try it. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year. So everybody, those are for loops. They will repeat some code a finite amount of times. Unlike with a while loop, a while loop will execute some code infinitely as long as its condition remains true. A for loop is limited in that regard. Well, everybody, those are for loops. If you can, give this video a big fat thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and well, those are for loops in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, we're going to use nested loops to create a program to draw a rectangle for us made out of a certain symbol that we choose. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, welcome back. So nested loops. A nested loop is a loop that's inside of another loop. There is an outer loop and an inner loop, and both of these combined are nested loops. So the uses, they vary. They're used a lot in sorting algorithms. So I thought, let's create a program where we will draw a rectangle. We'll have the outer loop in charge of counting the rows and the inner loop in charge of counting the columns. And we will let the user choose a symbol that they would like to create their rectangle of. So we'll need to accept some user input. So console.writeline, let's ask how many rows? How many rows? Actually, let's make this a right statement. Okay, and then we will store this within int rows, 
equals, then we will need to convert some user input, convert to int 32, because user input's always a string. Then within the parentheses, console.read line. Okay, let's ask for columns. So let's copy this, paste it. How many columns? Int columns. Then let's ask the user for a symbol to use. What symbol or character? And let's use a string. I guess you can use a char as well. String symbol, and we do not need to convert this because it's already a string. Okay, we'll have an outer loop in charge of counting the rows, and the inner loop is in charge of counting the columns. So for, then we need our index. By the way, it doesn't matter if you use a while loop or a for loop. It's just the concept of having a loop inside of another loop. I just so happen to be using a for loop for the outer loop and a for loop for the inner loop. So int i equals zero. We will continue this as long as i is less than our rows because we're letting the user choose how many rows. Then we will increment i by one during each iteration. Now we need an inner for loop and let's just copy this. Now one naming convention with the index of the inner for loop, since i is already taken, what people usually use for an index for the inner loop is j because j comes after i, I guess. So int j equals zero, j is less than columns, then j plus plus. Okay, now what we'll do within the inner for loop is display our symbol. So console dot right, make sure you use right and not right line, we will display our symbol. So this inner loop is in charge of the columns, the outer loop is in charge of the rows. Basically, how this is going to work is that once we enter our outer for loop, we will immediately enter our inner for loop. In order to complete one iteration of the outer for loop, we have to finish all iterations of the inner for loop. And once we finish all iterations of the inner for loop, we can complete one iteration of the outer for loop. And during the next iteration, we have to do it all over again. So on the next iteration, we would have to complete all the iterations for the inner for loop. So this will display a rectangle made out of a certain symbol. However, there is one thing missing, and I'll show you. How many rows? Let's say four. How many columns? Five. And what symbol? Uh, what about the... I don't know, at sign. All right, so this ended up in one long row. So after we complete our iterations for the inner for loop, we should probably move down to the next row, kind of like a typewriter. We finish one line, then we move down to the next row. So let's use an empty right line statement just to move down to the next line. So if we try this again, okay, four rows, five columns. Let's use an at sign. There we go, there's a rectangle. We have one, two, three, four, five columns, and one, two, three, four, four rows. So basically a nested loop is really just a loop that's inside of another loop. When you'll encounter it, it really varies, but they're used a lot in sorting algorithms. And this was a small program just to practice working with nested loops. All right, so if you want a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. Drop a random comment down below, and that is an example of nested loops in C Sharp. Hey everyone, it's your bro. Hope you're doing well, and in this video, we're going to create a number guessing game in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, let's create a number guessing game. We will randomly generate some random number between a set minimum and maximum, and we will let the user guess as to what that number is. If the number is too high or too low, we will give a hint, and the user can keep on guessing, and we'll keep track of how many attempts it takes. So we'll need a random object to generate some random numbers. Random, random, equals new random, and there's a few other things we'll declare as well at the top. Boolean, play, again. So if the user would like to play again, we can keep this as true. If they would like to quit, we can set this to be false. Int min, this will be the minimum value. Let's have the user guess a number between one and 100. Int max, 
but you can feel free to adjust these. Max equals 100. Int guess. I will declare this, but not yet assign a value. Int number. And int guesses. OK, we'll create a while loop, and we will let the user decide if they would like to play again. So our condition, while play again, equals true. But since this itself is a Boolean variable, you don't technically need this equals true portion. You could just say while play again, because this by itself would evaluate to be true or false. Now, if our user decides they would like to play again, we should probably reset everything. So let's take our guess and set this equal to zero. Guesses, this is the number of attempts. That equals zero as well. And let's generate a new random number. Number equals random dot next. And within the parentheses of the next method, we can list our minimum and maximum. But remember that this number is exclusive. But since we have these variables, we can place these here instead. So min and max. So this should be max plus one. This will generate a random number between one and 100 because like I said, this number is exclusive. Okay, then we will keep on asking the user to type in a number like guess again. So we'll need a nested while loop. While, and our condition is guess does not equal our number that is randomly generated. So let's ask the user to type in a number. Guess a number between and this next part's gonna get a little funky, plus min, plus, I'll add a dash, plus max, plus a colon. Okay, then we will take variable guess equals, and we'll need to convert some user input, convert to int 32, and within the parentheses, console dot read line all right then we will display whatever our guess is console dot write line guess colon space plus guess and now we need to check our guess versus the number and we can use an if else if statement if and the condition is guess is greater than number, we will display a hint. Console.write line. Let's say that guess plus is too high. Else if. And the condition is guess is less than number. Let's copy this. Guess is too low. And then if guess equals number, we escape the while loop. Oh, and we do need to increment our guesses by one after each guess. So let's place that right about here, right before we do another iteration of our while loop. Guesses plus plus to increment our guesses by one. Now, when we exit the while loop, that means that we eventually got the right number. So we will display the number with a right line statement, console.writeline number colon space plus number. Then we will display you win, console.writeline you win and let's display how many guesses it took, how many attempts. Guesses, colon, space, plus guesses. Then we should probably let the user decide if they would like to play again. And actually, let's declare one more variable. String response. And then we will assign this within the while loop. Let's do that here. We'll reset it. Response equals an empty string. Okay, then we'll have the user type in if they would like to play again. Would 
you like to play again? Y slash N. So they would have to type in either Y or N. Y to play again for yes and for no. Response equals console dot read line. And let's make this uppercase in case they type in something that's lowercase. Response equals response dot to upper. So if our response is equal to a capital Y play again equals true. Else play again equals false. Then when we escape our outer while loop, that means we are done playing this game. So let's find where that ends. Right here. Okay, let's say thanks for playing. Oh, it looks like I typed that already. So just type this in, I guess. All right. We're good. So let's run this. Guess a number between 1 and 100. What about 50? That's right in the middle, right? 50 is too high. What about 25? 25 is too high. What about 12? 12 is too high. This is a very low number, I guess. What about 6? Six? 6 is too high. Jeez. All right. 3? Three is too low. Our number is between three and six. How about four? Four is too low. Five. All right, finally. So it took seven guesses. Let's play again. I think I can do better. Guess a number between one and 100. Let's go with 50 again. 50 is too low. So something between 50 and 100. Let's go with 75. 75 is too high. Uh, what about 63? 63 is too high. Uh, 57. 57 is too low. How about 60? All right, 60. That took five guesses this time. Would you like to play again? No. Thanks for playing. Well, everybody, that was a very simple number guessing game in C Sharp. I'll post all of this code to the comment section down below if you would like a copy for yourself. If you can, give this video a thumbs up. Feel free to drop a random comment down below. And well, that is a very simple number guessing game in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's you bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, we're going to create a game of rock, paper, scissors in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, everybody, let's create a game of rock, paper, scissors. What I like to do is declare all the things that we'll need at the top of our program. We'll need a random object to generate a random number for the computer's choice. So we'll say that one equals rock, two equals paper, and three equals scissors. So we'll need to create a random object. Random random equals new random. And we'll create a Boolean variable named play again. And I will set this to equal true. So if the player decides to exit, they would not like to play another game. We can set this to be false. And we'll need a string variable to hold the player's choice. I will declare this, but not yet assign it. So this will store rock, paper, or scissors, and we'll need a string variable for the computer's choice as well. Okay, that's all of the different variables that we'll need. So let's create a while loop. While play again equals true. Now, if we're working with Boolean variables, we technically don't need this equals true portion because this by itself would evaluate to be true or false. So you can just say while play again, and that would work as well. And then if the player decides to quit, we can change that to false. Okay, now let's ask for some user input. Console.write, enter rock, paper, or scissors. And we will store the user's input within string variable player. Player equals console.readLine. Now, strings are case sensitive. What I'm going to do is take the player's input and make it all uppercase, just so that everything is consistent. Player equals player dot two upper. I guess you could make this all lowercase too. Okay, now let's display the player's choice with a right line statement. So what if the player decides to choose something that isn't rock, paper, or scissors? We would want some way to enforce that. 
So let's say that I choose the gun, and that's a valid response. So we should probably prevent the player from doing so. So what we'll do is use a nested while loop. So while, then surround this section of code within a set of curly braces, and we will continue to prompt the user to type in something that is valid, a valid choice. So this is our condition, while player does not equal rock. And I'm just going to copy this. Player does not equal paper. And player does not equal scissors. So we'll need to assign player and computer a value. Let's do that at the top of our while loop for play again. So player equals an empty string and computer equals an empty string. So this is kind of nice. When we do play another round, we can reset player and computer. Okay, let's try this. Enter rock, paper, or scissors. I pick the gun. Enter rock, paper, or scissors. How about a bomb? Fist? Nope. Okay, so we have to choose either rock, paper, or scissors. What about rock? Cool. So that is a valid response. Okay, so let's get rid of this right line statement. We won't really need it anymore. Now we'll need to generate a random number for the computer player, one, two, or three. And I will use a switch. So we will place the random number that is generated within the parentheses. We could say like, I don't know, int random num equals random dot next and the range is going to be one through four. So remember that this number is exclusive. This will generate a random whole number between one and three. Okay, then what I'm going to do is technically we don't need this portion. Like we could place random num within switch, but what I like to do is kind of shorten and condense my code. So I'm going to take this method of random not next and place it within the switch itself. And that would work as well. So let's examine some cases. Case one. That will be rock. Computer equals rock, all uppercase, then break. And we'll need case two in case the random number is two. Case two, computer equals paper, then break. And case three, computer equals scissors, then break. What I'm going to do after our switch is display the player's choice along with the computer's random choice. So let's use a right line statement. So player colon space plus variable player. Then let's create another right line for the computer. Computer plus computer. And let's run this. Okay. I will choose rock, player, rock, computer, scissors. Let's play again. I will choose paper, player, paper, computer, paper, and scissors. Player, scissors, computer, scissors. Okay, now we just need to examine our choices and see who wins. That's the next step. Now, what we'll do at this point is create a switch to examine the player's choice versus the computer's choice, and we can decide who wins. So let's create a switch, and we will examine the variable player against many different cases. So the first case will be rock. And for now, we'll just break. We'll fill this in a little bit later. Case, paper, break and case scissors and break all right we're going to check to see what the computer picked so if computer is equal to rock then it's a draw so let's write It's a draw. I think I'm missing a break statement. All right, then else if 
computer equals paper, that means that we lose. Else if computer equals paper, then we will write you lose. Else, technically we don't need a condition because the only choice left is scissors for the computer. Else, you win. So let's copy these statements, paste it underneath paper. So if we choose paper and the computer chooses rock, that means that we win. So let's change this to you win. If we choose paper and the computer chooses paper, that means it's a draw. Else you lose. Let's copy this again, paste it underneath scissors. So if we pick scissors and the computer picks rock, you lose. If we choose scissors, the computer picks paper, then we win. You win. Else, it's a draw. All right, let's test it. All right, enter rock, paper, scissors. Let's go with rock. Rock, paper, you lose. Let's choose paper this time. Paper, scissors, you lose again. And let's try scissors. Scissors, rock, you lose. Man, I kind of suck at this game. <laughs> let's try it again. Paper, paper, rock. Okay, I finally won one. Cool. Now at this point, we're going to let the player decide if they would like to play another round. So place this code at the end of our outer while loop. So I'm just going to follow the dots here. So that would go right here. All right, so let's use a write statement. Would you like to play again? Y slash N. So Y for yes, N for no. Actually, I think I'm going to create another variable. So let's do so at the top. String answer. And we should probably reset this to answer equals an empty string. Okay, so we will add one more variable. Okay, answer equals console dot read line. Then let's make it uppercase in case the player enters in something that is lowercase. We'll still count it. Answer equals answer dot to upper. Then let's check to see what the player enters in. If answer is equal to y, then play again equals true. Else play again equals false. All right, then outside of the while loop, we will display a goodbye message. Maybe we'll say thanks for playing. All right, let's try it one last time. Okay, enter rock, paper, scissors. Always choose rock. Player rock, computer paper, you lose. Would you like to play again? Yes. Let's pick rock again. Rock, paper, you lose. Okay, maybe you don't always pick rock. Would you like to play again? No, because this is a dumb game. Thanks for playing. Well, okay then everybody, that is a game of rock, paper, scissors. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. If you can, smash that like button, leave a random comment down below. And well, that's a game of rock, paper, scissors for C Sharp. All right, people. Well, I thought for practice, we could create a sort of calculator program. We can pick two numbers, we can add them, subtract them, multiply them, and divide them. So let's get started. This will be just a very simple project. I'm going to write just calculator program when we begin this program. And then maybe, I don't know, format it a little bit. Let's add some, I don't know, dashes or something just to kind of make this look nice. This will all be within the console. Okay, so we'll need to declare num1, num2, and a result. These will be doubles. Double num1, 
I'll set this equal to zero. Let's create num2 and result, double result. And I will set that equal to zero as well. Okay, we will need to ask for some user input. Console, the right line, enter number one, colon space. And then we will assign num1 equals, so user inputs always a string, we'll need to convert this to a double. Convert dot to double. And within the parentheses, we need console dot read line method. Okay, let's do the same thing for num2. Enter number two, num2 equals convert dot to double, pass in console.readline. Now we need the user to type in an option. Do they want to add, subtract, multiply, or divide? So let's type enter an option. Console.writeLine again. What about plus colon space add? Then minus colon space subtract asterisk for multiply. And forward slash for divide. You can add other options if you want to. Okay, let's take a look at this so far. So we have calculator program, enter number one, what about 3.14? Enter number two, uh, let's say, I don't know, five. Okay, a couple things I'm gonna change real quick. I'm going to change this right line to just right. Then I'm going to add a tab, escape sequence. That is backslash T for tab, just so that it looks better. Okay, let's continue. So I'm going to create a switch that will read our user input. Switch console dot read line. And we need matching cases. Case plus, so if somebody would like to add, we will take our result equals num1 plus num2. Console.writeLine, and I'll do some string interpolation. Your result, colon space, num1 plus num2 equals plus result. And then we need to break out of this case. Okay, let's do the same thing with minus case minus result equals num1 minus num2, num1 minus num2, and that's all we need. Then we need multiply, case asterisk, result equals num1 times num2, replace minus with asterisk, and then divide. case forward slash for division, result equals num1 divided by num2, and replace the asterisk here. And then we should probably add a default case, just in case somebody doesn't pick one of these options. Default, console that right line, that was not a valid option, and then break. Enter number one, 3.14. Enter number two, uh, let's say 6.9. And I would like to multiply these. So I will add an asterisk. 3.14 times 6.9 equals 21.666. All right, I'm just gonna change one thing. I'm going to add one line right before we read our user's input for what operation they would like to use. So let's add console dot right, not right line, enter an option. Then let's try it again. 3.14, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6
multiplied by 6.9 is 21.666. Okay, now what if somebody would like to continue using this calculator? So what we'll do is place all of this code within a do while loop. I'm not sure if I discussed this in the past, but a do while loop will always execute a body of code once and then it checks the condition at the end. So let's add that here. So we have do at the top, then we need our while with condition. While. All right, now before this, let's ask for some user input. Console.writeline. Would you like to continue? Capital Y equals yes, capital N equals no. And then we will read some user input. So within the while loop, the condition, this will be console dot read line dot two upper. So in case they type in lowercase y or n, we'll just change it to uppercase via the two upper method. And let's check to see if this is equal to y. If it is, then we'll reset our num1, num2, and result variables and do this all over again. And if they would not like to continue, let's write bye. Okay, let's try this again. What is 3.14 divided by 2? So enter number 1, 3.14, enter number 2, 2, and let's divide these. The result is 1.57. Let's type y for yes. All right, then we can do this all over again. What is 5 divided by 3.14? So I will divide. And the result is 1.59 something something something. Would you like to continue? I'm going to type n for no. Bye. So yeah, that's a very simple calculator program in C Sharp. I will post this code in the comment section down below. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well. And in this video, I'm going to explain arrays in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, everybody, so arrays. Think of an array as a variable, but it can store multiple values, not just one. So I have this string variable named car, and it contains the name of a car, BMW. So what we could do is turn this variable into an array so it can store multiple values. And this is all you have to do. After the data type, add a set of square brackets, and then surround all of the values with a set of curly braces. Boom, you got yourself an array, and that's all there is to it. So you can add multiple values to this array named car. And actually, I'm going to rename this as cars, so it's plural, so that we know that there's multiple values within here. So let's separate each value with a comma. So let's say we have a BMW, a Mustang, as well as a Corvette. Okay, then let's display what cars is with a right line statement. Console the right line cars. So this is what appears. We have the data type of our array instead of the values within the array. So if you need to access an element that is an item from an array, you need to add after the variable name, well, the array name, a set of square brackets, and then the index. So computers, they always start with zero. The first element would be zero. So place that number within the square brackets, cars at index zero, and the first element would be BMW. So let's display the other elements. Let's just copy what we have. Okay, let's display cars at index one. That will be this value because this is index zero. And that is Mustang. Then the next value, cars at index two. And that is Corvette. So let's take a look to see what happens if I attempt to access an element that doesn't exist. So cars at index three. So that would be something beyond Corvette. So we'll actually run into an error. We ran into an index out of range exception. So arrays do have a fixed size. You have to make sure that you're not accessing an element that doesn't exist. 
Now, if you need to update an element within an array, all you have to do is type the array name. In this case, it would be cars, straight brackets, and list the index. So if I need to change the first element within my array, I will say my array name cars at index zero equals, let's place a Tesla there instead, and then run this. So instead of a BMW in the first position, index zero, we have a Tesla. So if you need to access or update an element within an array, type the array name, straight brackets, and then the index. And remember that these always start with zero. So what we've done here to display the elements of an array is that we wrote a right line statement for each individual element. So a much better approach would be to iterate over our array using a for loop. And later on, I'll explain the for each loop. So to display all of the elements of our array easily, let's create a for loop. So we'll say int i equals zero. We'll continue this as long as i is less than. Now arrays have a length property. So type the name of the array dot length. Then i plus plus to increment our index. Okay, with our right line statement, let's display cars, straight brackets, and the index is going to be i. So i is zero for the first iteration, then during the next iteration, it will be one, then two, and then it will stop because this statement will no longer be true. Okay, let's try this again. So we have Tesla, Mustang, and Corvette. So an easy way to display the elements of an array is to write a for loop and set the index equal to i, whatever you have right here. But we'll have to discuss the for each loop coming up in a later video. One thing that you should know with arrays is that they have a fixed size. If you would like to declare an array and then assign values later, you'll need to declare that array with a fixed size of how many elements you're planning to place within that array. So that would look something like this. Let's turn this line into a comment. And this is how to declare an array. So type the data type, square brackets, the name of the array equals new, the data type again, square brackets. And then within this set of square brackets, we will list a size. So if I plan on adding no more than three elements to this array, I can place three here, but you can make this a larger size to accommodate more values. And if you don't use those values, they'll just remain empty, no big deal. And this will work the same as before. And then we'll just have to update some values. So cars at index zero, one, and two. Zero is a Tesla, one is a Mustang, and two is a Corvette. And this will pretty much work the same as before. Instead of just in one step declaring and assigning an array, we have done it in two steps. We declared the array and then assigned some values later. Well, okay, then everybody, that is an array. It's a variable that can store multiple values and they have a fixed size. So that's something you need to pay attention to. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. And well, those are arrays in C sharp. Oh yeah. All right, everybody, for each loops. A for each loop is a simpler and more elegant way to iterate over an array. However, it's less flexible compared to a standard for loop. I have an array of names of vehicles named cars. We have a BMW, Mustang, and Corvette. Then we can use a standard for loop to iterate and display the elements of this array. So this works fine. However, it's a lot of work to write all of this. Another approach, although it's less flexible, is to create a for each loop. This will iterate once for each element within my array. So type for each parentheses curly braces, and within the parentheses, we list the data type of each element. Then we need a name for each element that we're working with. Since we're working with cars, let's call each element a car. String car in the name of the array, cars. String car in cars then I will, with a right line statement, display whatever car is. So this is kind of like a nickname for the element that we're currently working with. So let's get rid of this for loop because we don't need it anymore and use our for each loop instead. And this works the same as before. One downside with a for each loop is that it's not flexible. With a standard for loop, we can iterate forwards, backwards, or even skip iterations. So use whatever loop is more appropriate for your situation. Well, everybody, that is a for each loop. It's a simpler and more elegant way to iterate over an array. However, it's not as flexible. 
If you just need something simple to display the elements of an array, you can easily use a for each loop. All right, everybody, so that's a for each loop. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and well, those are for each loops in C Sharp. All right, people, methods. A method performs a section of code whenever it's called, also known as invoking a method. And the benefit of using a method is that it lets us reuse code without writing it multiple times. Here's a scenario. Let's say that we have to write a program where we need to sing happy birthday to our friend three times because we would like to annoy him. One way in which we could do that without writing a method is that we would need to display as output, you know, the lyrics to happy birthday. I just made my own version of it. So happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear you, happy birthday to you. If I need to sing happy birthday three times, I would need to copy and paste this code two additional times. And that would allow me to effectively sing happy birthday three times. So after running this, we have all of our text repeated three times. Now, a better way of writing this would be to use a method where we only have to write this once and then we can keep on reusing it. Yeah, let's delete all of this. Outside of our main method, that will end right here. We need to create a new method. And the way we do that is that for this specific case, we have to write static because we're invoking a method from our main method, which is static. So we need static, but not always void, and then a unique and descriptive name of this method. What does it do exactly? So let's call this method sing happy birthday, then a set of parentheses, then a set of curly braces. And we have ourselves a method named sing happy birthday. And when we call this method, what kind of code do we want to execute? So let's copy and paste the lyrics to happy birthday and then place it within this method. Now to invoke a method or call a method, we have to type the name of the method followed by a set of parentheses. And I like to think of the parentheses kind of like a pair of telephones. They're communicating with each other. That's how I think of it at least. And then a semicolon to end the statement. So after running this, this will execute sing happy birthday once. Now, if I need to sing happy birthday two additional times, I can just call this method two additional times. Sing happy birthday, sing happy birthday, sing happy birthday. And I do not need all of this text. I only need to write it once. And then I can just keep on reusing it. And here we have the lyrics to my happy birthday song repeated three times. Let's move on to level two. We're going to create a string variable named name. String name equals and make up some name. Now, what if we attempt to use this variable within our method? So replace you with name. Happy birthday, dear name. Okay, here's the situation. The name name does not exist in the current context. Methods don't have access to any variables within another method. So anything within the main method, this sing happy birthday method cannot see. So we need to pass what are known as arguments over to this method in order to use these values or variables. So when you invoke a method and you need to send arguments over to a method, we just list whatever we would like to send over to this method within the parentheses. So I would like to pass name as an argument to this method. However, we need a matching set of arguments and parameters. Parameters are kind of like what this method is expecting to receive. And to create some parameters, we list the data type of what we're expecting, followed by some sort of name. So let's just say name. And now we can use this variable name that is declared within the main method. And we now have our name variable displayed within our happy birthday song. And here's how to send more than one argument to a method. Let's create an integer variable named age, and we will display the user's age within our happy birthday song. So separate each argument with a comma. We will pass name as well as age to our happy birthday method. But remember, we need a matching set of arguments and parameters. So we need to add a age parameter. So separate each with a comma, then list the data type of this variable first int, and then a name. We'll just call it age. And now we can use this age variable within our method. So let's create a line where we will display the person's age. So console.write line, you are plus age plus years old. And let's try this again. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear bro. You are 21 years old. Happy birthday to you. I guess my happy birthday song could use some work. Now these parameters, they don't necessarily need the same exact name as the arguments that we pass in. Let's rename name as birthday boy and replace age with years old. Okay, then replace any instance of name with birthday boy and age with years old. And this will work the same. So you can rename these parameters. What's important is the data type and the order of the values that you pass in. All right, everybody. Well, those are methods. They perform a section of code whenever they are called, also known as invoking a method. And the benefit of using methods is that it allows us to reuse code without writing it multiple times. We only had to write the lyrics to happy birthday once. Then if we had to sing happy birthday, you know, more than one time, we can just keep on invoking this method however many times that we need. So those are methods. If you can, give this video a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and well, yeah, those are methods in C Sharp. Oh yeah, the return keyword. Now the return keyword returns data back to the place where a method is invoked. So let's create a method to multiply two numbers together, something simple. So when we declare a method, we'll have to make sure that we do it outside of our main method. So right here, so we will say static void and we will name this method multiply and we'll need to pass in two numbers as arguments let's say that the data type will be double double x and double y okay now we would like to multiply these two numbers together and we will store them within double variable z double z equals x times y now, to return data back to the place where it's invoked, we can use this return keyword. And what kind of data would we like to return? Let's return whatever z is. Now, there's one change that we need to make. We need to replace this void keyword with the data type of what we're returning exactly. So since we're returning a double, we'll change void to double. If you're not returning anything, you can just keep that keyword as void. Now we can use this multiply method to, well, multiply two numbers together. So let's write a program where we will ask a user for some user input, multiply two numbers together, then return the result and display it. So let's accept some user input. And first we should probably declare the variables that we'll need. Double X, double Y, and double, let's call this result. And we will ask the user to enter in number one and then assign x equal, and we'll need to convert the user's input to a double because it's always a string when we accept user input. x equals convert dot to double, then add a set of parentheses. Within the parentheses, console dot read line. And we'll do the same thing for variable y. Enter in number two and then change x to y. Now, if we need to assign result of value, we can use this multiply method. So type multiply, add a set of parentheses to invoke it, but we'll need to pass two matching arguments because we have two parameters set up. We need to pass in two double values or variables. So we will pass x and y as arguments to this method multiply. So this return keyword will return whatever z is back to the spot in where this method is invoked. And we will store the result within this variable named result. And then we should probably display it. Let's display result. And well, that's it. Let's try it. Enter in number one. Have you always wondered what pi times 420 is? Well, we're about to find out. It is 1318.8. So yeah, that is the return keyword. It returns data back to the place where a method is invoked. And if you would like, you can actually shorten this even further. We don't necessarily need to store the result within, you know, a new variable. We could just say return x times y, and that would work the same too. That is the return keyword. It returns data back to the place where a method is invoked. If you're able to, give this video a thumbs up, leave a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's the return keyword in C Sharp. Let's go, bros!
Okay, it looks like we're talking about method overloading. Now methods, they can actually share the same name, but you'd need a, a different set of parameters. A method's name plus its parameters equals a method's signature, and methods must have a unique method signature. Let's take this method, for example, called multiply. So this returns a times b. So what if I would like to multiply more than two numbers, like three numbers? Well, this method is only set up for two arguments. So one thing that we could do is method overload. So we can use the same name, like we can reuse it, but we need different parameters. So to solve this problem, I'm going to create a second multiply method, and this will have a different set of parameters, giving it a different method signature. So let's create a method that has three parameters, a, b, and c. Return a times b times c. And you can see that that problem went away, and this should work. So 2 times 3 times 4 equals 24. And I can just keep on creating more methods. So basically, that's method overloading. Methods can share the same name, but they need different parameters if they do share the same name. A method's name plus its parameters equals the method's signature. And methods must have a unique signature. So yeah, that's method overloading. If you would like a copy of this code, I'll post this to the comment section down below. If you can, smash that like button, drop a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's method overloading in C Sharp. Oh yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what's better than overloaded methods? The params keyword. Now, a method's parameters can take a variable number of arguments if we use the params keyword, and the parameter type must be a single dimensional array. What's the benefit of this? Let me explain. So let's say that we have an online store. We have a method to check out where we will basically sum up a customer's prices and return a total. And we'll tell the customer, you have to pay this total. What if the person checking out has a variable number of items that they would like to buy? Well, we would have to set up a bunch of different methods. Like what if they only buy one item? Well, there's a checkout method that accepts one argument, another checkout method that accepts two arguments, then three, and then we continue on and on and on. So yeah, don't do this. A better solution would be to use this params keyword where we only need a single method and this one single method can accept a varying number of arguments. We don't need like several copies of the same method then. So to use the params keyword, precede our data type with the word params. Then after the data type, follow this with a set of square brackets. Now this parameter A is now an array I'm going to name this as something a little more descriptive, like prices, because we're working with prices. So we need to iterate over the elements of an array and create a total. So I'm going to create a local variable named double total. So you can have variables with the same name, but they need to be within a different scope. So these are in different methods, so they are not visible to each other. Double total. I will set this equal to zero to begin with and we'll use a for each loop to iterate over the elements of this array. For each double price in prices, total equals total plus whatever price we're working with, but I'll shorten this to plus equals price. Then at the end, we will return total, and this should work the same. Okay, the total price is $24.74, but there's some formatting that we'll have to do in a future video. And then I can just keep on adding items to my, you know, fictional shopping cart. Like I would like to buy a bottle of water for a dollar and a t-shirt for $10.25. So you see by using this params keyword, a single method can accept a varying amount of arguments. So method overloading isn't always necessary if you're working with a lot of different arguments. You're not really sure how many arguments are going to be passed in. Okay then everybody, that is the params keyword. It can be applied to a method parameter so that it can accept a variable number of arguments, but the parameter type must be a single dimensional array. And that is the params keyword. If you can, help me out by smashing that like button, drop a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's the params keyword in C Sharp. Hey, well, it looks like we're on exceptions today. An exception is an error that occurs during execution. So here's an example. I have a small program where we will ask a user to type in two numbers, divide those numbers, then display the result. So what if I type in something that's not a number? I would like to divide the number five by the word 
Pizza. We'll encounter an exception, and this interrupts our program. We encountered a format exception. Input string was not in a correct format. So any code that is considered dangerous, where it might cause an exception, we can surround with a try block. So I would consider this code to be dangerous. So type try, then a set of curly braces. Surround any code that is considered dangerous with the set of curly braces. Now, if we have a try block, we also need a catch block. So after the try block, add catch. And the catch block catches and handles exceptions when they occur. But we need to specify what kinds of exceptions we would like to catch and handle. So catch, parentheses, curly braces. And this is kind of like a parameter. So I would like to catch and handle any format exceptions, then add E. So if we encounter that same exception again, instead of our program being interrupted, we can do something else instead. So let's write a message and let the user know to type in only numbers. Enter only numbers, please. And let's try that again. Enter number one, five. Enter number two, pizza. Enter only numbers, please. And this did not interrupt our program. That's the important thing. Now, these try and catch blocks, they will only catch and handle format exceptions. What if somebody accidentally divides by zero or intentionally does so? So we do not have a catch block set up for that. We can add multiple catch blocks. So let's catch any divide by zero exceptions. So catch parentheses curly braces. And the exception we would like to catch is divide by zero exception, then add E. So if somebody attempts to divide by zero, let's display a message. You can't divide by zero, idiot. But this only occurs with integer division. So let's turn our doubles, x and y, into integers. And we'll have to change this cast as well. So change two double, two int 32. So if we attempt to divide a number by zero, which we can't mathematically do, this is what happens. Enter number one, five. Enter number two, zero. You can't divide by zero, idiot. And this will not interrupt our program. Now, you can add a catch block that just catches everything, but it's not considered good practice to add by itself. So sometimes I'll add a like catch all block, just in case if there's any exceptions I do not anticipate. So at the end, we can add exception, E. But it's difficult to let the user know what went wrong exactly because it'll just print when any exception occurs. Something went wrong. So this will catch everything. Let's remove the first two catch blocks. So let's take five divided by the word pizza. Something went wrong. Now catch exception E does catch everything, but it's considered poor practice to have this by itself because basically you're shrugging when something goes wrong. You should let the user know exactly what went wrong. So it's better practice to catch specific exceptions first. Then at the end, you can add, you know, exception E in case there's anything you don't anticipate. By the way, I changed X and Y back to doubles. Now, the last thing we need to talk about is the finally block. The finally block is optional. It always executes regardless if an exception is caught or not. So at the end, let's create a finally block type finally curly braces. If there's anything you'd like to do after your try and catch block, regardless if an exception occurs or not, you can place that here. What people typically use the finally block for is to close any open files if they need to reset anything. But for this example, let's just print something. So let's display a thank you message. Thanks for visiting. If we do not encounter any exceptions, this finally block will still execute. Five divided by one is five. Thanks for visiting. Now, if we do encounter and catch an exception, well, that finally block is still going to execute as well. Thanks for visiting. So yeah, those are exceptions. They are errors that occur during execution. They interrupt the normal flow of our program. Any code that is considered dangerous, we should surround with a try block and catch any exceptions when they occur. And finally can be added and it will execute regardless if an exception is caught or not. So yeah, those are exceptions. I will post this code in the comment section down below. If you can, smash that like button, drop a random comment down below. And well, yeah, those are exceptions in C Sharp. All right, welcome back. We're talking about the conditional operator, which is represented by a question mark. So the conditional operator is used in conditional assignment. If a condition is true or false, and we follow this formula, we have some sort of condition or expression. 
then we add a question mark, kind of like we're asking a question, is this true? If it is, do X, if not, do Y. So we'll write a simple program to check the temperature outside. So we'll write this using an if else statement first, and then later on we'll use the conditional operator and take a look at the differences. So let's say we have a double named temperature, and I'll set this equal to 20 degrees Celsius, as well as a string message. I will declare this, but not yet assign it. So what if we would like to assign our variable message a custom message based on the temperature? Well, if we're using if else statements, that would look like this. So we need a condition if temperature is greater than or equal to, let's say 15 degrees Celsius, then we will assign message a string message equals it's warm outside else message equals it's cold outside and then at the end i would like to display my message within a right line statement console that right line message and this will work just fine no issues so my temperature is currently 20 and this will print the message it's warm outside now there is a way to shorten this and that's by using a conditional operator so if we were to take that approach we would have to follow this formula so let me just copy this we need our condition our condition is temperature is greater than or equal to 15. question mark like we're asking a question if it's true then do this so we will take it's warm outside in place of x if not then we do this it's cold outside but these are returning values so we need to assign them to something so we will say message equals this is our condition temperature greater than or equal to 15 question mark if that's true assign this if not assign that and that's all there is to it and we don't really need all of this anymore and then i will display my message within a right line statement and this will do the same thing it's warm outside you could even take this a step further too. You could place just this within a right line statement and get rid of the message completely. We don't even really need that message variable. So yeah, that's the conditional operator. You can use this in conditional assignment if you need to assign some variable if some condition that you set is true or false. It's kind of like a shortcut. So yeah, that's the conditional operator in C sharp. All right, what's going on, people? String interpolation. String interpolation allows us to insert variables or values into a string literal. We precede a string literal with a dollar sign, and then any placeholders within a string literal that is interpolated, we can use to insert values or variables within. So here's an example of where string interpolation could be useful. Let's say we have three variables, first name, last name, and age. Let's declare those string first name make up a first name string last name make up a last name and then an age okay so what if we would like to display somebody's first name last name and their age let's use a standard string literal first and we'll look at the differences so if i would like to display something like hello plus first name plus I'll add a space plus last name and then maybe add like a period at the end well I would have to concatenate all of these separate strings together and then let me display age to console.write line you are plus age plus years old so this works fine, but an easier way is to use string interpolation. So what we're going to do is create a string literal and then precede this with a dollar sign and then write a string normally. Hello, wherever you would like to insert a value or variable, add a set of curly braces as a placeholder. And I would like to insert first name here, then add a space. And here within my string literal, I will insert last name and then maybe add a period to the end. And let's do the same thing with our second line. So we need a string literal, a double set of quotes, precede this with the dollar sign, you are, curly braces, age, years, old. And this will do the exact same thing. 
However, it's less work. So hello, first name, last name, you are age years old. Another thing that you can do too is that when you display one of these values, you can allocate some room after the variable name, add a comma, and then how many spaces you would like to allocate. Let's say that when I display my age, I would like to allocate 10 spaces worth of room to display my age. And this is what that looks like. You are, then I have 10 spaces, including the two digits in my age. And if this was negative, this would be left aligned. So my age is all the way over here, then I have eight spaces afterwards. So yeah, that's string interpolation. It allows us to insert variables into a string literal. We precede a string literal with a dollar sign and then curly braces with them as placeholders for values or variables. So yeah, that's string interpolation in C sharp. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, what's going on? Multi-dimensional arrays. So just a fair warning, this is a difficult topic. If you want, you can skip this video. You won't hurt my feelings. But if you'd like to know what a multi-dimensional array is, well, here we go. So a multi-dimensional array is an array of arrays. So I have three standard arrays. I have different car manufacturers, Ford, Chevy, and Toyota. So each array has three different kinds of cars. A multi-dimensional array is good if you need like some sort of grid or matrix of data. So what I would like to do is to create an array of arrays to simulate maybe like a parking lot to park all of these cars. So to create a multi-dimensional array, this will be a two-dimensional array. We need to list the data type of what we're storing, strings, then a set of straight brackets, and then within the straight brackets, add a comma. So now I'm going to name this array, let's say parking lot equals, and then we add our curly braces, much like what we do with standard arrays. However, I'm going to add each array within the set of curly braces, and then separate each with a comma. So this can be somewhat difficult to read. I like to kind of condense it all and just make it look nice. So you can see that this resembles sort of like a grid with rows and columns, and that visual is going to help us. So to access one of these elements, we need to list an index for the row and an index for the column. So let's say I would like to change this explorer to something else. So in order to access this element, I'm going to type the name of our multidimensional array, straight brackets, and then I need a row and column. So these always start with zero. This would be row zero, row one, row two. I need to access row one, so that would be zero, then comma for column, and then I need to count the row number, zero, one, two. So that would be zero comma two for this element within my two-dimensional array. So I'm going to change this to something else. So let's say that this is a Ford Fusion. And then let's display these elements. We can use a for each loop. For each, the data type is string. Let's say car in parking lot. And then I will just iterate through these. Console that right line car. So this will iterate nine times, one for each element within our two dimensional array. So we have a Mustang, F-150, then Fusion. So we updated Explorer to Fusion. So let's update maybe this Corolla to something else. So let's count the row number. That would be zero, one, two. Parking lot two, and the column number is zero. And let's say that this is a Tacoma. And try this again. Okay, we have instead of a Corolla, a Tacoma. Now, if you would like to display this as like a grid, we can use nested for loops for that. So let's get rid of this for each loop. I'll just turn this all into one giant comment. Okay, so to display this as like a grid, we'll use nested for loops. The outer loop will be for int i equals zero. We will continue this as long as i is less than parking lot dot get length method and then pass in the dimension so pass in zero for the first dimension i plus plus 
and then we need a nested for loop. So change i to j, get length 1. So this represents the second dimension. Remember that these always start with 0. And then change i to j++. So during each iteration of the inner for loop, let's change this from right line to right. I will display parking lot straight brackets i comma j. Then I'm just going to add a space to separate each car. And then when we escape our for loop, we need to go down to the next row. So I'll use an empty right line statement. So by using nested for loops, we can display our two dimensional array as sort of a grid or matrix. So we have our Mustang, F-150, our Fusion, Corvette, Camaro, Silverado, Tacoma, Camry, and RAV4. So if you ever need like a grid or matrix of data, you can always use a multi-dimensional array. And these are kind of the steps to set it up. So yeah, those are multi-dimensional arrays. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, classes. A class is really just a bundle of related code that you would like to organize together. It can be used as a blueprint to create objects with object-oriented programming, but we'll discuss that in the next video. So my main method is located within a class named program. The point of this class is well to group my program together, but there are classes too that have certain functions, for example the math class. The purpose of the math class is to contain a bunch of useful methods related to mathematics. And let's take a look at this. So this class is named math, and all that's in here is a bunch of methods related to mathematics. So that's kind of the point of this class, but we can create our own classes too. Now to create a class, we can either do so outside of our class program, or create a class within a separate c -sharp file. I'll show you both ways. So to create a class, make sure that we're not writing this within our class program, so that ends here. Type class, and let's create a class to group a bunch of useful messages together, like message methods. Class, messages, curly braces. And let's create a few methods related to messages. So this is going to be more of like a utility class. Void, hello. And when we use this method, let's display a message like, hello. Welcome to the program. And let's create maybe two more. Void, hello. Void, what about waiting? Like we're waiting for something. I am waiting for something. And what about goodbye? Void, bye. Bye. Thanks for visiting. If you would like to create a class within a separate c -sharp file, I would recommend opening your Solution Explorer. If you don't have that open, you can find it here. Go to View, Solution Explorer. Right-click on your namespace, Add. Class. Class, and then I will name this Messages. Add. Okay, then I'm going to take my code from within this class, cut it, delete my class, and then paste it within this class Messages. So you can either write your class within the same c -sharp file or a different one. If I would like to use some of these methods found within the Messages class, there's one of two things that I need to do. I either need to create an object from this class, or I need to precede my class definition with the word static, followed by everything within my Messages class. So we'll talk about creating objects in the next video. So for now, we'll just have to use the static keyword, and I'll create a separate video on this too. And we should now be able to use these methods found within my messages class. So if I need to display a hello message, I would type the name of the class, that would be messages, then dot to access the members. However, these are not visible, so we need to make them public. And that'll be a separate video on access modifiers. So I would like this to be a public method. So precede static with public. And we should now be able to see those methods. So type messages again dot and here are those methods i would like to use the hello method and that will display my message hello welcome to the program i also have that waiting message 
messages dot and that was waiting as well as goodbye messages dot bye so hello welcome to the program i am waiting for something bye thanks for visiting so basically a class is just a bundle of related code and it can be used as a blueprint to create objects otherwise you can use a class more or less as a utility class but when you define your class, you'll have to precede the class definition with the word static. And to make this public and accessible, you would have to precede each method with public and static. So yeah, those are classes. They're really just a bundle of related code. You can use them as a utility class or use them as a blueprint to create objects, which we'll discuss in another video. If you found this video helpful, please help me by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and well, yeah, those are classes in C Sharp. All right, objects. An object is an instance of a class. That means that we can use a class as a type of blueprint to create objects with object-oriented programming. So look around you right now, you're surrounded by objects. Next to me, I have a microphone, a monitor, a mouse, and a cup of coffee. So we can use code to mimic real world objects. Objects can have fields and methods. These are defining characteristics and actions that an object can perform. They describe what an object has and what an object can do. And in today's video, we will be instantiating human objects, but we'll need the help of a human class as a type of blueprint to design what sorts of fields and methods that all humans should have. So outside of our class program, you can either do this within the same c -sharp file or a separate one within your Solution Explorer. I'll keep it all within the same c -sharp file this time. Let's create a class named human, then curly braces. So let's add some fields. Fields are kind of like the defining attributes of what all humans should have. Let's say that humans have a name and an age. So I'll define those much like what we do with variables. String name, I will declare this but not yet assign it, as well as int age. So these are fields, they're defining characteristics of what an object has. Now let's create some methods. What kinds of actions can humans perform? They can eat and they can sleep. Void, eat. And then I will display something when we invoke this method. Let's say name plus is eating. And then let's create a sleep method. Void, sleep. Name plus is sleeping okay now this is what we need to do to instantiate an object from a class type the name of the class human we need a unique name for this human object let's call this human object just human one human human one equals new human again add a set of parentheses and a semicolon there we go we now have a human object named human one now there's just one problem the fields and methods of this human object are not visible so if i type human one dot we can't access the name and age fields as well as the eat and sleep methods so normally i wouldn't recommend doing this because this isn't secure but just for learning purposes let's precede our fields and methods with the access modifier of public so that these are publicly accessible from another class so if we type human one dot, we should be able to access our name and age fields, as well as the eat and sleep methods. So let's give human one a name, human one dot name. And let's assign human one a first name of Rick, like from Rick and Morty. And let's give him an age too, human one dot age. And he will be 65 years old. And we should be able to use the eat and sleep methods now human one dot eat and then human one dot sleep so after invoking these two methods eat and sleep this will display rick is eating and rick is sleeping so congratulations we have successfully instantiated a human object and the nice thing about classes is that we can keep on reusing this class to create more humans if we need more than one so this time, let's create a second human. So follow this formula, the name of the class, human. Then we need a unique name for this human object. Human one is taken, so let's name the second human, human two, equals new human. And then we can assign some of the fields of our human class. So we need a name and an age. 
So human two's name will be Morty, and his age will be 16. And this time, let's have human two use the eat and sleep method. So Rick is eating, Rick is sleeping, Morty is eating, Morty is sleeping. So that's basically what an object is. It's an instance of a class, and a class can be used as a blueprint to create objects. And objects can have fields and methods. Fields are what an object has. Methods are what an object can do. Think of it that way. So yeah, those are objects. They're an instance of a class, and a class can be used as a blueprint to create objects. So if this video helped you out, help me out by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and as always, subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Alright, constructors. A constructor is a special method found within a class. It has the same name as the class name. In the last video, we created a human class, but it's missing a constructor. If we do not explicitly create a constructor, there is a hidden one behind the scenes that is automatically called, and it is used to create an object for us. So let's explicitly create a constructor. So you type public, because we want this to be publicly accessible, and then it has the same name as the class name. Then add a set of parentheses, then a set of curly braces. This works just like a method, and we can even set up parameters. So let's set up name and age parameters. So we need to list the data type, string, name, and int age. Now, in order to create a human object, we have to pass a matching set of arguments. We need to pass in a name and an age. Well, a string to function as a name and an integer to function as an age. So we don't manually need to assign these fields anymore. We can just pass these values as arguments. So with human one, human one's name was Rick and his age was 65. So I will pass these as arguments, Rick and 65. And you can see that that red underline went away. So let's do the same thing for human two, Morty and his age is 16. And we no longer need to manually assign those fields. However, within the constructor, we'll need to do so. So type this dot, the name of the field we would like to assign, equals the name of the parameter. And in this case, they have the same name. This dot name equals name. And this dot age equals whatever this is, age. And this will work the same as before, but we did not need to manually assign those values to those fields. So after calling the eat and sleep method for both human one and human two, this will display Rick is eating, Rick is sleeping, Morty is eating, Morty is sleeping. So that's kind of what a constructor is. It's a special method found within a class, and it's automatically called when we instantiate an object if we do not explicitly create a constructor. But if we do, we can manually assign some values to fields of an object. Let's try a different example this time. Instead of humans, let's create a car class. We will instantiate some car objects. So let's delete our current class and create a new one. Class, car, then curly braces. Cars will have, let's say, four fields, a make, a model, a year, and a color. String make, string model, int year and string color then to create a constructor this will have the same name as the class name precede this with public car parentheses curly braces and again this is a special kind of method and we can set up arguments and parameters so we have string make string model int year and string color. And then when we receive arguments, we can assign them to these fields. This dot make equals make. This dot model equals model. This dot year equals year. And this dot color equals color. Then let's create maybe a drive method public void drive and we will display something you drive the plus make plus a lot of space to separate make and model plus model okay now let's instantiate some car objects so we type the name of the class car then we need a unique name or identifier for this car 
let's call this first car, car1 equals new car, parentheses, semicolon. But to instantiate a car object, we have to pass a matching set of arguments to these parameters. We have to pass a make, model, year, and color. So car1, let's say, is a Ford Mustang. Ford Mustang, the year will be 2022, and the color is red. And then let's have car1 use the drive method. So type car1.drive, then a set of parentheses to invoke it. You drive the Ford Mustang. Now let's create car2. It's the same process as before, but we need a unique name or identifier. Car, car2 equals new car. This will be a Chevy Corvette, and the year will be 2021, and the color is blue. And then let's use the drive method of car2. Car2.drive. You drive the Ford Mustang, you drive the Chevy Corvette. So yeah, that's a constructor. It's a special method found within a class, and it has the same name as the class name, class car, and the constructor name is car as well. And it can be used to assign arguments to fields when creating an object. There's a few other things you can do with constructors too, but we'll discuss that in future videos. So yeah, those are constructors. If you can, smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and well, yeah, those are constructors in C Sharp. Oh yeah, let's do this. All right, the static modifier. The static modifier is used to declare a static member, one which belongs to the class itself rather than any one specific object. I have a class named car. Cars have a field named model and a constructor to assign a model when we instantiate a car object. And I have two car objects, car1 and car2. Car1 is a Mustang, car2 is a Corvette. Here's the situation. Let's say that we're going to have a race, but we need to keep track of how many cars are instantiated that are entering our race. One way in which we can do that is to create a static field to keep track of how many cars are created. So let me show you what this looks like with a non-static field first. So let's declare an integer variable named number of cars to keep track of how many cars we create. So I will declare this, but not yet assign it. And within my constructor, I will increment number of cars by one. Remember that with constructors, you're not limited to only assigning values to fields. You can do like any sort of code that you want. Remember that it's just another kind of method. Okay, so every time we instantiate a car object, we will increment number of cars by one. And then let's display number of cars. So we need to access this in a non-static way by typing the name of a car object like car1 dot followed by the name of the field. But it looks like we need to make this public. Public int number of cars. Car1 dot number of cars. Let's do the same thing for car2. Car2 dot number of cars. Now you would think that the number of cars would be two, right? And that's where you're wrong. Number of cars for both car1 and car2 are both one because each car object has their own copy of the number of cars field. And within the constructor, when we increment each copy of number of cars, well, it's only ever going to be a maximum of one. So one way in which we could fix that is to change this field to a static field after public type static, public static int number of cars and we can no longer access this field in a non-static way by typing the name of an object followed by the name of the field. We would have to access this field in a static way by typing the name of its class followed by the name of the field. So type the name of the class car followed by, you know, dot, then the name of the field. So this field now belongs to the car class and no one object has complete ownership of it. It's kind of like they're all sharing the same variable. And let's try this again. So the number of cars that we have created is two. Now, just to test everything, let's create a third car. We have a third racer within our race. So car three will be a, what about a Lambo? And we now have created three cars. So again, by preceding this field with the static modifier, the class now owns it. We can also apply the static modifier to a method as well, public static, and we'll create a method to begin our race. Let's call this start race. So we don't want each object to be able to start the race on their own terms, right? 
So it would be better if the car class itself has a start race method. So then if we would like to begin our race, we can access it in a static way. The race has begun. Then if I need to invoke this method, I type the name of the class car dot the name of the static method start race, then a set of parentheses to invoke it. And this should now begin our race. The race has begun. And then you can also apply the static modifier to a class itself, but then you can't instantiate objects from this class. You can see that we're getting errors. Cannot declare a variable of static type car. So that's kind of like the deal with the math class. In order to use a method of the math class, we wouldn't create like a math object, right? Like math, math one equals new math, right? And then we wouldn't type math one dot round to round a number. It's a lot easier just to use directly the math class and type math dot round. So that's kind of the idea behind a static class. You can't create objects from a static class. And we kind of learned about that in the video on classes. Well, in conclusion, the static modifier can be applied to a field, a method, or a class itself. Anything that is declared static now belongs to the class, and no one object has ownership of it. So that is the static modifier. If this video helped you out, help me out by smashing that like button, drop a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's the static modifier in C Sharp. All right, overloaded constructors. By using overloaded constructors, this is a technique to create multiple constructors within the same class, much like that video on overloaded methods. So with overloaded constructors, multiple constructors can have the same name, but they need a different set of parameters because a method's name plus its parameters equals a unique method signature, and each method must have their own unique signature. So let's create a class named pizza, and there's going to be four fields. Let's have string bread for the type of bread we would like for our pizza. Like, is it flatbread, stuffed crust, plain? A field for sauce, cheese, and topping. Then let's create a constructor. Public pizza. And then we need to set up the parameters. String bread. String sauce, string cheese, and string topping. And then we'll need to assign these. This dot bread equals bread. This dot sauce equals sauce. This dot cheese equals cheese. And this dot topping equals topping. All right, then let's construct a pizza object. Pizza, let's call this pizza, all lowercase, equals new pizza. Then we need to pass in something for the bread, the sauce, the cheese, and the topping, because we can't construct a pizza object without bread, sauce, cheese, and a topping. We need all four in order to construct a pizza object. So let's pass in something for the bread. Let's say I would like a stuffed crust pizza. Stuffed crust for the sauce, let's say red sauce. And the cheese, what about mozzarella? I don't remember how to spell mozzarella. Mozzarella, I'm taking a guess here. And a topping, pepperoni. So we can construct a pizza object just fine, right? But what if we would like a pizza without any toppings, like a plain cheese pizza? So I'm going to get rid of that topping. Well, we can't construct a pizza without a topping. We need to add something because we only have one constructor set up and we need to pass in something for a topping. So one way in which we could solve this problem is to have multiple constructors, overloaded constructors. We can pass in a varying amount of arguments. So if we would like a cheese pizza without any toppings, we can use that specific constructor that will construct a plain cheese pizza. So let's copy this constructor. They can have the same name, but they need a different set of parameters. So I'm going to remove this topping parameter, and we will not assign this dot topping equals topping, and we can now create a plain cheese pizza. And let's do the same thing with, I don't know, maybe somebody doesn't want cheese on their pizza. So pizza with only bread and sauce. 
and then another pizza with only bread. I'm not even really sure if it's considered a pizza then. Maybe it's garlic bread or something, but I don't know though. We can now create a pizza object that has no toppings, no cheese, and no sauce. So by using overload constructors, we can construct objects with varying amounts of fields. Maybe we would like toppings, maybe we don't. Well, we have a choice now. So yeah, that's overload constructors. It's a technique to create multiple constructors with a different set of parameters. They can share the same name, but you need a different set of parameters because a constructor's name plus its parameters equals a constructor's signature. And each constructor needs a unique signature. So yeah, those are overloaded constructors in C Sharp. If this video helped you out, help me out by smashing that like button. Leave a random comment down below. And well, yeah, those are overloaded constructors in C Sharp. All right, what's going on people? Inheritance. So inheritance is this programming concept of one or more child classes receiving fields, methods, etc. from a common parent. Kind of like how people inherit genes from their parents. Well, with programming, we can kind of do something similar. Parent classes can have children classes, and anything that the parent class has, the child classes now have. So here's an example. Let's create a parent class named vehicle. Not any kind of specific vehicle, just a generic vehicle class. Class, vehicle, and there will be one field, let's say public int speed. And I'll set this equal to maybe zero. And let's create a method, public void go. All vehicles can go somewhere. And all we'll display is this vehicle is moving. We can inherit this speed field and this go method from the vehicle class. So this vehicle class is going to have children. So let's create a car class, a bike class, and a boat class. So type class car. Then to inherit from another class, type after the class name, colon, and then the parent in which you would like to inherit from. So car is going to be the child class, vehicle will be the parent class. So car will have access to its own speed and go method. And then you can add anything additional within the car class, like number of wheels, public and wheels. And I'll set this to four for all car objects. Now let's create a bicycle class. It's the same process as before, class, bicycle. And this will inherit from the vehicle class as well, but let's change wheels to two. And then let's create a boat class, class boat. Inherits from vehicle, wheels, zero, because, well, it's a boat. Okay, so let's instantiate a car, bicycle, and boat object. So let's do that here. Car, car equals new car. Bicycle, bicycle. Keep on spelling bicycle wrong. Bicycle equals new bicycle. And boat, boat equals new boat. So if we take a look at this car object, car dot, there is a speed field as well as a go method, even though there's nothing within this car class besides wheels. So since car is the child class and vehicle is the parent class, car has access to a go method and a speed field, even though there's nothing within here except a wheels field. And of course, car objects do have a wheels field as well, which we stated within the car class. So let's just test these. I'm going to display car.speed, car.speed, followed by car.wheels, and I will have this car use its go method, car.go. All right, so our car speed is zero. That's because we set it to be zero within the vehicle class. This car has four wheels, which we stated within the car class, and this car class has a go method that states this vehicle is moving. So I bet the same thing applies to our bicycle and boat object. So let's copy these three lines of code, change car to bicycle, bicycle.speed, bicycle.wheels, and bicycle.go. And the same thing applies to boat, boat.speed, boat.wheels, boat.go. So all three of these different types of vehicles each have a speed field, a wheels field, and a go method. So the point of inheritance is that we can reuse code. I mean, we could just copy these fields and methods and then paste them within each of these classes. But imagine that you have hundreds of different classes and we need to change like go to start. 
Well, it's a lot easier just to make that change in one place than having to manually go through all of our classes. So yeah, that's kind of the benefit of inheritance. We can keep anything that these classes have in common within a common parent class, and these classes can simply just inherit these fields and methods. So yeah, that's inheritance. If you liked this video, be sure to smash that like button, drop a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's inheritance in C Sharp. All right, what's going on? Abstract classes. Abstract is a keyword that we can apply to classes, properties, and methods. But in this video, we're going to focus on abstract classes. Now, you can apply the abstract keyword, it's a modifier, to a class. And that indicates that this class is missing components or is an incomplete implementation. So let's take a look. We're using inheritance here. So I have a class vehicle. Vehicle has a speed field as well as a go method. And there's three children classes, car, bicycle, and boat. And these are complete implementations. So car has four wheels and a max speed of 500. Bicycle has two wheels, a max speed of 50. And boat has zero wheels and a max speed of 100. I just made up some numbers for the max speed. I can create a car object, bicycle object, and boat object just fine. These are complete implementations. But unfortunately, I can also create a vehicle object. Vehicle, vehicle equals new vehicle. So vehicle is incomplete. It's missing a number of wheels and a max speed. So imagine that we're having a race and somebody decides to pick the vehicle, but we want somebody to pick a specific implementation of a vehicle like a car, bicycle, or boat. I would like to prevent people from creating generic vehicle objects. So this is kind of like, imagine somebody picks the invisible vehicle in like a racing game or something. One way in which I can prevent people from instantiating vehicle objects because it's not finished, it's an incomplete implementation, is to precede this class definition with this abstract keyword. So if I precede class with abstract, I can no longer create a vehicle object cannot create an instance of the abstract type or interface vehicle. So that adds a little bit of security to our programs. If there's a class that you do not want to be able to instantiate objects from, you can just precede that class definition with the abstract keyword, and you cannot create an object from that class. And that's basically what the abstract modifier does. We can indicate that a class, we can also apply this to properties and methods as well, but that's a video for another day. So when we precede a class definition with abstract, we are indicating that that class is missing components or is incomplete, so we should not be able to instantiate objects from this class, which adds a little bit of security. So yeah, that's the abstract keyword. If you found this video helpful, help me out by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and well, yeah, that's the abstract modifier in C Sharp. All right, what's going on people? So in this video, I'm gonna show you all how we can create an array of objects. I have a class car. Cars have one field, a model field, and a constructor to assign an argument to this model field. So let's create some car objects. Car, car one equals new car. Then pass in a model of your choosing. Let's say that car one will be a Mustang. And let's create maybe two more cars. Car two and car three. Car 2 will be a Corvette, and Car 3 will be a Lambo. So we'll need an array to work with, too. So in the past, when we've created arrays, we will list the data type of what we're storing within our array, like strings, ints, whatever. So after the data type, add a set of straight brackets. But the data type is going to be the data type of the objects that we're working with. Since we're working with car objects, we'll change that to car. Car, straight brackets then we need a name for this array. Let's say garage. It's kind of like we're parking cars within a garage. Equals new, the data type again, straight brackets, then a size for this array. Let's say three. Then we will assign some of these indexes with an object. So let's begin with garage at index zero. This will equal, let's say car one. It's as if car one is parking within our garage at this parking spot number of zero. Then let's park car two and car three. So garage at index of one equals car two, garage at index of two equals car three. Then let's display these. Console.write line, garage at index of zero. So let me just show you what this looks like first. We're not accessing the model quite yet. We're just displaying whatever's within garage at index of zero. And what we get is the namespace followed by the data type of our object. 
So if we need the model of this object, whatever's within garage at index of zero, I'm going to follow this with dot model. And that will display my car's model, which is a Mustang. Then let's do the same thing for garage at index of one and two. So garage index of one, garage index of two. Then make sure to follow those with dot model. So within our garage, between indexes zero through two, we have a Mustang, Corvette, and a Lambo. Now, another way in which we could display these is with a for each loop, for each, parentheses, curly braces, and with our for each loop, we have to list the data type of whatever is within our array. Car, and let's call each car just car. Car, car, in, garage. Then, during each iteration, we will display car dot model, and that will do the same thing. However, this time we will iterate through our array. Now there's another way in which we could write this too. We don't need to necessarily define a size for our array, then create some named car objects, and then assign those objects directly to each index. We could just declare an array and then immediately instantiate some objects all in one step. So we're going to create a new array. Car, straight brackets, I will call this garage, equals curly braces, and then we will pass in just new car, then you need to pass in a model and do the same thing with your other two cars. Okay, this will do the same thing. It's just written in less steps. So these are known as anonymous objects. They don't technically have a name. So I may or may not make a separate video on anonymous objects. So within our garage, we should have a Mustang, Corvette, and a Lambo. So yeah, that's how to create an array of objects in C Sharp. Hey, what's going on people? In this video, I'm going to show you all how we can pass an object as an argument. So here's the rundown. I have a class car. Cars have two fields, a model and a color, and a constructor to assign a model and color argument that we receive. I have one car object. Car, car1 equals new car. The model of this car is a Mustang and the color is red. So I'm going to create a method that will change the color of my car, but I have to pass in a car object. So let's create a method to handle that for us. Public static void, it's not returning anything. And let's call this method change color. And we'll need two parameters, a car that we would like to change the color of. So the data type is going to be car, as well as a name for this parameter. Let's name whatever car object that we receive as just simply car. And we need a color as well. That would be a string, string color. Then to change the color of this car, I would type car.color equals whatever color that we receive. And that's it. So now when we invoke this method, we have to pass in a car object as well as a color. So that would be change color. And the car object that I will pass in as an argument is car1, the name of the object, as well as a new color. Let's color this car silver. And then let's display our car's color and model. Console dot right line car one dot color plus I'll add a space plus car one dot model. And this should change the color of our car to a silver Mustang. So to pass an object as an argument, you need to make sure that you have the right parameter set up. You type the data type of this object followed by a name for this parameter. Then when you invoke this method, you have to pass in the name of the object. Let's try something a little bit different. Let's create a method to copy an object. So let's get rid of this change color method, but we'll keep our car object. So we'll create a method to return a car object. So public static, instead of void, the data type is the type that we're returning. We're returning a car object. So replace void with car, then we need a name for this method. Let's call this copy. So we will pass in a car object. The data type is car, and I will name this argument that we receive as car. Now, one thing that we can do to copy a car object is return a new car. And then we'll need to pass in a model and a color. So the model of this car is car.model and the color is car.color. Now, if I would like to copy car1 and create a second car, a copy of it, I can type car, car2, 
equals copy, and then I will pass this object as an argument, and then let's display the fields of car 2. And I bet it's a red Mustang. Oh yeah, there we go. So we successfully created a copy of car 1 by returning a car object. So yeah, that's how to pass objects as arguments. You just have to list the data type of the object. Since we're working with cars, we had to set up a car parameter. Then if you would like to return an object, instead of void, you would replace void with the data type of the object you would like to return. And if you would like to return a new object, like what we did with this copy method, you would return a new and then call the constructor of whatever object you would like to create and return. So that's why we called the car constructor and then we returned that new car back to this spot here. So it's kind of like we replaced this method with calling the car constructor, something like that. So yeah, that's how to pass objects as arguments, as well as return objects from methods too. So yeah, if this video helped you out, feel free to help me out by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, what's going on people? We're talking about method overriding. Method overriding provides a new version of a method inherited from a parent class. I have a class animal. This is a parent class, also known as a super class or base class. And I have two child classes, dog inherits from animal and cat inherits from animal. So let's say that we have a method within our animal class. So let's create one. Public void speak, all animals can speak. And then when a class that inherits this method uses this method, let's display a message such as the animal goes burr. Okay, let's create a dog object and a cat object. Dog, dog equals new dog. Cat, cat equals new cat. Now dogs, since they're inheriting from the animal class, they have a speak method as well as cats, cat.speak. So when both this dog object and this cat object invoke their speak methods that they inherit from the parent class of animal, we will execute this method. And when my dog and cat object speak, that will display the animal goes brrrr. Okay, so we can actually provide our own implementation of this method. We can override this method and do something else. Now, to override a method, it needs the same method signature, the same name, and the same parameters. So if I would like to override this speak method within my dog class, I'm going to type public override void, the same type as the original method, and the same name and signature. Now, to create an overriding method, the method that is inherited must be virtual, abstract, or already overridden. So I'm going to add this modifier, virtual. So we can now override this method. You can also do this with an abstract method too, but the class needs to be abstract as well. And there needs to be no body. But we'll just stick with virtual in this video. Okay, so we have our virtual method. That means that this method can be overridden. And now we can provide our own implementation of the speak method specifically for dogs. So let's display a different message. Console.writeLine, the dog goes woof. So notice that we don't have anything within our cat class. Now if both dog and cat use their speak methods, the dog will instead speak and say the dog goes woof. And our cat is still using the method that it inherits from its parent animal. If I would like to do the same thing for my cat objects, I can override this method again. Public override void speak. And then I can provide a different implementation. The cat goes meow. So after both dog and cat use their speak methods, this displays the dog goes woof, the cat goes meow. So by using method overriding, we can provide a new version of a method inherited from a parent class. However, the inherited method must be abstract, virtual, or already overridden. And method overriding is commonly used with the toString method, which we still need to talk about, and polymorphism.
So yeah, that's method overriding. If you found this video helpful, please smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, welcome back everybody. The toString method. The toString method is an inherent method of objects. Its job is to convert an object to its string representation so that it is suitable for display. So I have a class car. Cars have four fields, a make, a model, a year, and a color. And I have a constructor to assign some of these fields. So what we could do, if we would like some of this information, we can override the built-in toString method of objects that includes cars too. So let's create a car object. Car, car equals new car. Then I need to pass in a make, model, year, and color. Let's say that this is a Chevy Corvette. The year is 2022 and the color is blue. So within a right line statement, if I type the name of my object car, there's actually a two string method. And when we invoke this method, let's take a look to see what happens. So this displays the namespace followed by the type of the object that we're working with. So we can actually override this method so that when we use the two string method, we can return a string representation of this object. Maybe we could display the make, model, year, and color somehow. So we'll need to override this method to string. So let's do that here. We're gonna type public, then to override a method, we have to use that override keyword, then type to string. And this might auto-generate for you. So we're returning a string. And by default, this will return base to string. What we can do instead is return something else. We can return some sort of string representation that's suitable for display. Let's say that when I use the toString method of my car object, I'd like to return a sentence that says, this is a make plus model, a Chevy Corvette. So let's do something like this. Let's say string message equals this is a plus make then I'll just add a space plus model really you can do whatever you want and then I'm going to return this string or I could take all of this copy it and then return this is a make plus model I could do that too and that would work so when I use the two string method, it's going to return this sentence and insert make and model. This is a Chevy Corvette. One thing you can do too, you don't necessarily need to directly invoke the two string method. You can just type the name of the object and that will do the same thing. So this will behind the scenes call the two string method. So before when we displayed our object with a right line statement, it would display the namespace plus the type of the object. But if you were to override the toString method, you can return some sort of sentence or string representation of your object that is suitable for display. So yeah, that is the toString method. It converts an object to a string representation that is suitable for display. And really, you can type whatever you want here. Just be sure to return a string. So yeah, that is the toString method. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well, and in this video I'm going to explain polymorphism in C Sharp, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Alright, what's going on people? Polymorphism. Polymorphism is a Greek word that means to have many forms. With programming, objects can be identified by more than one type. They can have many forms. For example, let's say that we have a dog. A dog could be considered a canine, an animal, and an organism. So a dog has more than just one form. It has more than one data type. Here's the situation. We're going to have a race. We'll enter in a car object, bicycle object, and boat object. So I have four classes. Vehicle is the base class, otherwise known as the parent class, and car, bicycle, and boat all inherit from the vehicle class. So with my race, I need to create a car object, bicycle object, and boat object. So let's do that. Car, car equals new car. Bicycle, bicycle equals new bicycle. And boat, boat equals new boat. I would like to place all of these objects within an array for my race. But what's the data type of the array going to be? 
So let's try and make an array of cars and add our car, bicycle, and boat. And let's just see what happens. I will name this array just vehicles equals, and then within curly braces, add whatever objects you would like. I would like to enter my car into the race, my bicycle, and my boat. Okay, but we're running into some errors here. Cannot implicitly convert bicycle to car. So I stated that the data type of this array is going to be cars. I can only enter car objects, so I have no issue there. But I cannot enter in my bicycle and boat objects into this array. But one way in which we can solve this is by using polymorphism. So we can find what they all have in common. They all identify as vehicles because they all inherit from the vehicle class. These objects have more than one form. They can be identified by more than one type. So instead of my array being an array of cars, I'm going to change this to vehicle because, well, these three objects identify as well a car, a bicycle, and a boat respectively, but also vehicles because they inherit from the vehicle class. So you can see that this is valid. If you need to create an array of different types of objects, you have to find what they have in common, and then you can just use that as a data type. They are all also considered vehicles. Let's move on to part two. What I would like to do is have all of these vehicles use a go method so they will all begin the race at the same time. So let's create a go method within each of these classes. Public void go. And we'll just display the car is moving. Place that within the car class. Let's make a go method for bicycles. Change car to bicycle, and then the boat is moving. Okay, now to iterate over this array of vehicles, we can use a for each loop. For each, now what's the data type of our vehicle array? Well, it's vehicles. Vehicle, vehicle, in vehicles. And now I would like each vehicle to use its go method, vehicle.go. So each vehicle will use its go method, but there's one more thing that we need to do. We need a go method within our vehicle class. So all of these methods within our car, bicycle, and boat classes, all are going to be overriding a go method found within the vehicle class. So let's create a virtual method. Public virtual void go. And we don't necessarily need to define anything within the go method because we're going to be overriding this method. Okay, then we need to use this override modifier. All right, now when we iterate over this array of vehicles, each vehicle will use its go method. It's as if when we would like to begin our race, all of the vehicles within our array will use their go methods at the same time. The car is moving, the bicycle is moving, the boat is moving. So yeah, that's polymorphism. It's a Greek word that means to have many forms. Objects can be identified by more than one type. And in this example, we created an array of vehicles. Our car identifies as a car, but it also identifies as a vehicle, and objects do identify as objects too, so cars identify as objects. And the same thing can apply with bicycle and boats in our example. So yeah, that's polymorphism. If you found this video helpful, be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, interfaces. An interface is much like a parent class or base class. It defines a sort of contract that all classes inheriting from need to follow. An interface can contain properties, methods, events, and if there's any of those declared within an interface, anything that inherits from that interface needs to be implemented within an inheriting class. An interface declares what a class should have and the class that it inherits from defines how it should do it exactly. So here's an example. We'll create three classes, rabbit, hawk, and fish, and two interfaces, prey and predator. All right, now let's create two interfaces. To create an interface, you type interface and then the name of the interface. However, a common naming convention with interfaces is that you precede the interface name with capital I. So if we would like a prey interface, we would type I prey. 
And then let's create a predator interface. Interface I predator. Now with these interfaces, we can pretty much declare anything within these interfaces, but if one of these classes would like to inherit from this interface, they need to implement anything declared within them. So let's say that if you're prey, then you need a method to flee because you're fleeing from predators. I'm going to declare a flee method, void flee. We will declare it but not implement it. Implementing this method is the job of the inheriting class that would like to use this interface. Let's say that rabbits will inherit this interface I prey, colon I prey. And in order to do so, we need to implement this method of flee within the rabbit class in order to use it. Public void flee. And then be sure to add a body to this method. So when we invoke this method, let's write the rabbit runs away. Okay, now we can create a rabbit object. Rabbit rabbit equals new rabbit. And I bet there's a flea method. Rabbit dot flea. And let's try it. The rabbit runs away. Now let's have our hawk class inherit this predator interface. Now with our predator interface, let's create a method to hunt. Void hunt. We will declare it but not implement it. Implementing this method is the job of the classes inheriting this interface. So hawk will inherit the I predator interface, but we need to implement that hunt method. Public void hunt. And then let's display the hawk is searching for food. And we can create a hawk object. Hawk hawk equals new hawk. So let's take a look at our hawk object. Hawk dot and there's no flea method because we're not implementing the prey interface, we're implementing the predator interface. So there is a hunt method and not a flea method. Hawk.hunt. The hawk is searching for food. Now with interfaces, you can inherit more than one, unlike with standard inheritance. So fish, they could be both prey and predators. To inherit two interfaces, after the colon, you can separate each with a comma. So fish will inherit the I prey and I predator interfaces, but now they need to implement both of these methods, flee and hunt. So let's do so. Public void flee. The fish swims away. And now we need to implement that hunt method. Public void hunt. The fish is searching for smaller fish. All right, now let's create a fish object. Fish, fish equals new fish. So fish have both a flea and a hunt method. Fish.flea, fish.hunt. The fish swims away. The fish is searching for smaller fish. So an interface defines a sort of contract that all classes inheriting from should follow. An interface declares what a class should have, and the inheriting class defines how it should do it. The benefits of using interfaces, for one, is that you can inherit multiple interfaces, unlike with standard inheritance. There's added security, and this gives us a plug-and-play style of coding, because anything that has the same interface will definitely have the same implemented methods and properties. So you can swap these out for like a different creature if you would like. So yeah, those are interfaces. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, welcome back everybody. A list. A list is a data structure that represents a list of objects that can be accessed by index. It's similar to an array, but they can increase and decrease dynamically in size during runtime, which arrays cannot do. So here's an example of an array. An array has a static fixed size, and we cannot change it normally after runtime. 
So let's create a standard array just for this example. Let's create an array of food. String food equals new string. And let's say that this array has a size of three. So I'm going to add some elements to this array. And then I can display these elements with a simple for each loop. Pizza, hamburger, and hot dog. So if I attempt to add another element to this array, this is what happens. We'll run into an exception, an index out of range exception, because index was outside the bounds of the array. So you can't normally change the size of an array. Another option is to use a list. A list can increase and decrease dynamically in size during runtime. So let's create a list. Step one is that we'll need to import system.collections.generic. So include this at the top. I'll place it right underneath using system. And this is how to declare a list. List, then within angle brackets, list the type of object you would like to store, strings. And then I will name this list food equals new list angle brackets the data type again parentheses semicolon and we now have a list named food and to add elements to this list there is a built-in add method food dot add then within this method pass in the object you would like to store i would like to store let's say a pizza then a hamburger then a hot dog so food dot add pizza hamburger, and hot dog. And let's take a look. So we have our pizza, hamburger, and hot dog. And I bet we can add even more than three elements. So it appears that our list can resize dynamically, which is a bonus. Then to access one of these elements, it's much like an array, you use that set of straight brackets. So I'm going to display whatever's within element number zero, food index zero. And that would be pizza. So accessing an element is the same as an array. You just type the list name and then add a set of straight brackets, then the index number. Okay, so here's a few other useful methods of lists. There is a remove method, food.remove. Then type in what you would like to remove. I would like to remove fries. And let's see if that's still in here. Nope, fries is missing. Pizza, hamburger, hot dog. So that is the add method and remove method, but there's a few other useful methods. So we can insert an object at a given element. Let's insert maybe sushi at index one via the insert method. Food.insert. Then we need an index and an item. So at the beginning of our list, at index zero, I will insert sushi. Sushi, pizza, hamburger, hot dog, fries. We can get the current size of our array using the count property. So within a right line statement, I'm going to display food.count property. And the current size of our list is four. So that is the count property we can find the index of an element. Food.index of, and let's find where pizza is. So that is at index zero. You can also find the last index of a given item. So what if we have fries both in the beginning and at the end? Food.add fries. So I have that in the beginning and at the end. So I'm going to use the last index of method. Food dot last index of fries. And the last index of fries is at four. Zero, one, two, three, four. So let me get rid of that. Okay, we can check to see if our list contains a given item using the contains method. Food dot contains pizza. This will return a boolean. True if pizza is within our list and false if not. Pizza is within our list, so that returns true. And that is the contains method. Then we have sort. 
food.sort. This will sort our list alphabetically. So our list in alphabetical order is fries, hamburger, hot dog, pizza, and we can sort in reverse order, food.reverse. And our list in reverse order is fries, hot dog, hamburger, pizza. We can clear our list, food.clear. And now our list is empty. And lastly, we can convert our list into an array. So I'm going to declare a new array string, let's say food array equals food dot to array. String item in food array. So we have pizza, hamburger, hot dog, fries. Well, okay then everybody, that is a list. It's similar to an array. It's a data structure that represents a list of objects that can be accessed by index. It's similar to an array, but they can increase and decrease dynamically in size, but they waste more memory. So yeah, those are lists in C-sharp. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and as always, subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, what's going on everybody? So in this video, I'm gonna show you all how we can create a list of objects from a custom class of ours. In the last video, I showed you all how we can create a list of strings. But what if we would like to create a list of players to keep track of the amount of players in our game and their names? So let's create a list. List, then we need angle brackets and the data type of the object we would like to store within our list. I would like to store player objects. And I'll name this list players because we're keeping track of the players. Players equals new list, angle brackets, our data type again, player, parentheses, semicolon. So we now have a list that can store player objects. So let's instantiate some player objects. And I have a field set up username. You can also set up getters and setters too if you prefer. So let's create some player objects. Player, and we'll call this player player1 equals new player. But we need to pass in a username as an argument. Let's say that this is Chad. And I'll create maybe two more players. So player one, player two, player three. Player two will be, what about Steve and Karen? Okay, now to add our player objects to our list, type the name of the list, dot add, and then pass in the name of the object. Players dot add player one, then do the same thing with player two and player three. Then I'll use a for each loop to display all these. For each, the data type is player, player in players. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to console.write line each player. But since we're displaying each object directly, what's going to be displayed is the namespace plus the data type of our object. We can access the username field and that will display each player's username, or we can overwrite the two string method. So we have Chad, Steve, and Karen, or we can override the two string method. So let's try that too. Public override two string. And I'm going to return username. So then when I use console.writeLine, I can just type in the object's name. So we have Chad, Steve, and Karen. Now, another thing that you can do when we instantiate these player objects, we can do so anonymously. So within the add method of our list players, we can simply just pass in new player, then pass in a name. And then we don't necessarily need to create a name for each of these objects. So I'm going to pass in new player Steve and new player Karen. So this is optional, but I like to create anonymous objects. It's less work. So we should have our three players, Chad, Steve, and Karen. So yeah, that's how to add objects to a list within the angle brackets. You just list the type of object that you would like to store within your list. So yeah, that's a list of objects in C-sharp. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, we have a lot to talk about today, getters and setters. But before I explain what these are, let me explain the situation. 
we have a class car and we have one field within our car class speed. So when we construct a car object, we need to pass in something for the speed. Maybe this is miles per hour, kilometers per hour, doesn't really matter. So let's say that somebody takes our car object and changes the speed to like, whatever this number is, 100 million. Actually, let's make that a billion. How can we prevent people from doing this? Because currently our car is going way too fast. So one way in which we could do that is to change this field from public to private, but then we can't access it at all. Another way is to set up getters and setters, and this adds security to our program via this concept called encapsulation. So we need to first set up a property for this field. The property name is the same as the field name, except it's capital. So type public, if you're returning something, list the data type, then speed, and then let's make this capital, then add a set of curly braces. A property combines the aspects of both fields and methods, and it shares the same name with the field. So it's kind of like something in between a field and a method, and it contains accessors, a get and set accessor. Now to first assign a value, we'll need to change our constructor. Instead of assigning the field speed, we will assign the property speed. So this has a capital S. Let's create a get accessor first. When we would like to get the value of speed, whatever is contained within speed, we will use this get accessor. So type get curly braces, and we will return speed. And then we'll need to assign this with the set accessor then make sure you have that semicolon at the end. So by using this get accessor, this will read whatever value is within our field. Then we'll need a set accessor if we would like this to be writable. Set curly braces. So what we'll do here is set speed equal to value. So value is kind of like a parameter. Properties combine the aspects of both fields and methods. So when we assign a value to speed, well then this value is going to be this. So it's kind of like an argument and a parameter. And within our set accessor, we can actually set up like some code or some rules or something. So if somebody attempts to change the speed, we could write an if statement, like if value is greater than, let's say 500, then we will limit this. Let's change speed equal to 500 then. Else, speed equals value. Now car.speed is inaccessible due to its protection level, so we need to access instead of the field, the property, so that's speed with a capital S. And then if we're going to display the value of speed, we'll access the property instead of the field. So if we attempt to set our speed equal to 1 billion, well, we will access this set accessor and then it's going to be limited to 500 then. So if we attempt to change our speed to 1 billion, it will be limited to 500, and then we can still display the value and access it because by having a getter and setter, this is both readable and writable. So yeah, those are getters and setters. They are accessors found within a property. A property combines the aspect of both fields and methods, and if you have a private field, you can also set up a property that has getters and setters for more security. So yeah, those are getters and setters in C Sharp. All right, everybody, we have to talk about auto-implemented properties. This is an intimidating name, but don't worry, it's actually fairly simple. They are shortcuts when no additional logic is required within a property. You do not have to define a field for a property and you only have to write get and or set inside the property. Here's an example. I have a class car, and what if we would like a model field and property? So that might look something like this. Make sure to not make your field public for this example. So this will be a string named model for a model of car. And I would like to set up a property that has get and set accessors. So that would be public string model with a capital M, curly braces, and then I need a get and a set accessor. All we'll do within the get accessor is return model, and that's the field. And set will be model, our field, 
equals value. And within my constructor, I will set this dot model property. Make sure that you have capital M equals model, whatever our parameter is. So if you're not doing anything else within your getter and setter, there's actually a shortcut to all of this, and that's by using an auto implement property. So this is what we'll do. We're going to instead get rid of all this and type public string model with a capital M curly braces get semicolon set semicolon. And this will do the same thing. However, it's a lot less to write. So if there's no additional logic that you need besides, you know, setting the value and getting the current field, well, you can just use an auto implemented property. And this will do the same thing. Let's test it. So let's create a car object. Car, car equals new car. Then pass in a model of car. Let's say a Porsche this time. And then I would like to display the car's model. Car dot model property with a capital M. So there will still be a model field, but it's hidden. And this car's model is a Porsche. So that's like a shortcut you can do. An auto-implemented property is a shortcut when no additional logic is required in the property. You do not have to define a field for a property, and you only have to write get and or set inside the property. So yeah, that is an auto-implemented property. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, drop a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. All right, what's going on, people? Enums. Enums are a special kind of class that contains a grouping of named integer constants. We tend to use enums when we have values that we know will not change. So here's an example. Let's create an enum of planets, and we will associate a planet number with each named planet. So to create an enum type, enum, then a unique name, kind of like we're creating a class, then curly braces. So I'm going to add the name of each planet within our solar system, beginning with Mercury, and then separate each with a comma. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, then just continue on in this pattern. This isn't necessary, but I like to place each of my members on a new line within an enum. I think it's easier to read. Okay, we now have an enum of planets, and there's an associated integer with each of these members. If we do not explicitly set an integer, by default, the first member is 0, then 1, 2, 3, then you just follow that pattern. So let's access one of these members of our enum of planets. Let's display a message. Planets.pluto is a planet. So to access a name of one of these members, you type the name of your enum, planets, dot, the name of your named member, Pluto. This will return the name, not the integer. Let's try it. Pluto is a planet. This is no different from using the toString method. This will do the same thing. Pluto is a planet. Okay, now if we need the associated integer with each of these named members, we would cast this member as an integer. Let's change our message around. Let's say that planets.mercury is planet number, then to access one of the integers stored within a member, that would be planets dot, the name of a planet, Mercury, and then we will precede this with parentheses, int. This will convert our named member into an integer. So our message is now, Mercury is planet number zero. So these named members always begin with zero, but we can change that and set them. Let's say that Mercury equals one, Venus equals two, and then continue on in this pattern. Let's display Pluto as well, because Pluto is feeling left out. Planets.pluto is planet number, planets.pluto, then cast as an integer. Okay, Mercury is planet number one, Pluto is planet number nine. Let's try something a little bit more complex. Let's create an enum to keep track of the radius of each planet. Enum planet radius. And let me just copy this. Okay, here's the radius of each planet in kilometers. Mercury is 2439, 6051 for Venus, 
And then I'll just fast forward the footage. You can copy this down if you'd like. All right, we have the radius and kilometers of each planet. So these are in name integer pairs. Let's create a variable to store the name of one of our planets. String name equals, what about Earth? Planet radius, the name of our enum, dot, the name of our member, Earth. So if we're going to store this within a string variable, we need to use the to string method. And then let's display this just to test it. Let's say planet colon space plus name. And this should display just Earth. Planet Earth. Okay, let's get the radius of Earth. Int radius equals planet radius dot Earth, then cast this as an integer. Console dot right line. Let's say radius colon space plus radius. Radius 6371. Let me add kilometers. So that's kind of the nice thing about enums is that we don't necessarily need to remember all of these numbers. It's kind of like we're storing variables, so to say. They are name integer constants that will not change through the life of a program. Now let's move on to a challenge round. Let's create a method that will calculate the volume of one of our planets when we pass in a radius. Public static will return a double, and this will be the volume method. And there is one parameter. The parameter is planet radius, and we will name this just radius. Okay, we need to return, let's say volume. and double volume equals, and here's the formula to calculate the volume of a sphere, 4.0 divided by 3.0 times math.pi times our radius to the power of three. So we can use math.power, pass in our radius, make sure to cast this as an integer, to the power of three. And let's call the volume method and store this within a double named volume. Double volume equals, we will invoke the volume method and pass in planet radius dot earth. And then we'll display the volume. Console dot right line, volume colon space plus volume, and I think that's in cubed kilometers. All right, and the volume of Earth is whatever number this is, 1083 something 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 cubed kilometers. So yeah, those are enums. They're like a special class that contains a set or grouping of named integer constants. We tend to use enums when we have values that we know will not change. And to get the integer value from an item, you must explicitly convert it to an integer. So yeah, those are enums. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. If you wouldn't mind, please like, comment, and subscribe. One like equals one prayer for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, generics. All right, let's get started. Generics. Anything that's generic is not specific to any particular data type. We can make something generic by adding a set of angle brackets, then T. We can make classes generic, methods, fields, whatever we want. This allows for greater code reusability for different data types. Let's say that we have three different types of arrays, an array of integers, doubles, and strings. Let's create those. Int array, I'll call this int array, equals, I don't know, one, two, three. The elements really aren't important. The data type is. Okay, then let's say we have an array of doubles. I will name this double array, and the elements are 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Then let's say that we have an array of strings. String array equals one, 
two, and three. Okay, what if I would like to display the elements of each of these arrays? So we can use a method for that. Let's begin with a method to accept an array of integers. So let's add that here. Public, static, void, we're not returning anything. And let's say that this method is named display elements. So there is one parameter. If we're displaying an array of integers, well, that will be our parameter int array, and let's call this array. And then we'll need a for loop or for each loop to iterate over the elements of this array. Let's use a for each loop. For each int item in array, then we will write, preferably not write line item, then maybe I'll add a space. Okay, let's call the display elements method that we just created and then pass in our int array as an argument. And let's see what happens. Okay, we have the numbers one, two, three. So what if we attempt to pass in our double array, display elements, then we will pass in our array of doubles. So we actually can't use this method for doubles. We can only use this for integers. Cannot convert from double to int. If I would like to display my array of doubles, well, I would need a completely different method that accepts an array of doubles as an argument. So I'm going to copy this current method that we have, change int to double, and change int to double here as well. And then we can call this version of our display elements method. And this will do the same thing. Actually, let me make one change. I'm just going to add a right line to the end of these. So basically, we have two methods that do the exact same thing. However, they accept a different data type as an argument. Let's add one more method for strings. Public static void display elements. The parameter is an array of strings for each string item in array. And then I can use the string version of display elements, but pass in our string array. So we have each of our three different types of arrays all displayed. So this is a lot of work. We have three methods that do basically the same thing. However, they accept different arguments. So what if we had one method that could accept basically any data type? Well, that's where generics come in. So let's take these first two methods and delete them. We will no longer need them. We're going to turn this method into a generic method. So after the method name, add a set of angle brackets, then add T. So really, you can put anything you want between these angle brackets. I like to say thing because I think it's funny. We're going to accept a thing as an argument. So we need to change that here as well. So change any instance of a data type to T or thing if you're using thing. Okay, so change string to thing. We're accepting an array of things for each thing item in array. So now we have one method that accepts all data types. We can reuse this one method for an array of integers, doubles, and strings. Yeah, and it appears to work. So that's where generics are helpful. Anything that's generic is not specific to a particular data type. We can add angle brackets, T, or really anything within these angle brackets. Just make sure that it's consistent. So we can add this to classes, methods, fields, etc. And this allows for greater code reusability for different data types. So instead of three different methods that all accept different data types, we have one that accepts basically all data types. So yeah, those are generics. If you found this video helpful, be sure to smash that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your bro, hope you're doing well, and in this video I'm going to explain multi-threading in C Sharp. So sit back, relax, and well, enjoy the show. If you find this video helpful, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Your support will help keep this channel running. All right, all right, all right, threads. A thread is an execution path of a program. We can use multiple threads to perform different tasks of our program at the same time. So when we begin a program, we have one thread that is running and that is named the main thread. To work with threading, include at the top, using system.threading. 
So let's get the current main thread that is running and I'll assign this to a local variable of the thread data type. Let's say thread main thread equals thread dot current thread. So this will assign the current thread that is running to a local variable named main thread or whatever you want to name it. So I'm going to change the name property of main thread to equal, let's say main thread. And then I'll display this with a right line statement, main thread dot name. And the name of this thread is main thread. Here's our job. Let's say that we need two timers to run. One is counting up from zero to 10 and the other is counting from 10 to zero. One is counting up, the other is counting down, but we need both of these timers to run concurrently. So if we were to write these both on the same thread, this is what this would look like. And then later on, we'll have these timers run on different threads. So let's create a countdown and count up method. Public static void count down. And then I'll need a for loop to iterate 10 times. For int i equals 10. Then I will continue this as long as i is greater than or equal to zero and then decrement i by one during each iteration. And during each iteration, let's say that timer number one colon space plus i plus seconds. Now we can actually have our current thread that is running sleep for a given amount of milliseconds by typing thread dot sleep, then pass in how many milliseconds you would like your thread to sleep. So 1000 milliseconds for one second. And then when we escape our for loop, let's display that timer number one is complete. And we'll also need a count up method. So let's copy count down, paste it, change down to up. I is equal to zero. We will continue this as long as I is less than or equal to 10. Increment I by one during each iteration. Timer number two, timer number two is complete. So let's invoke both count down and count up. So remember that these are both running on the same thread, our main thread. And when we complete our main thread, let's display that main thread dot name plus is complete. And I'm just going to hide this line here. Okay, let's go. So we have timer number one that's running currently. Timer number two has not started yet because these are both running on the same thread. So timer number one is complete and now we're working on timer number two. And now timer number two is complete. Our main thread is complete. So if I would like both of these methods to execute at the same time, I would need to create some additional threads. And here's how to do so. Thread, let's name this thread one, equals new thread. And within the constructor of our thread, let's pass in the method we would like to execute. Thread one is in charge of counting down and thread two is in charge of counting up. So each of these threads has a built-in start method, which we need to invoke to begin each of these threads. Thread1.start and thread2.start. And we can get rid of these. We now have one thread in charge of counting down and the other thread is in charge of counting up. And our main thread is still running in the background. So our main thread is complete and we have one timer that's counting down and the other that is counting up. And as you can see, these are both running at the same time concurrently. So if you have a method that has parameters, there's one additional step. Let's say that we have, I don't know, a string name or something. We don't necessarily need to use these. Okay, so we can't use these as they are currently. So what we're going to do is within the constructor of our threads is pass in what is known as a Lambda expression. So parentheses, arrow, then the name of our method, countdown, parentheses, then any arguments if there are any. Let's say, I don't know, timer number one. I probably won't use this at all, but this is just for an example. Okay, let's do the same thing with thread two. So we have a lambda expression, parentheses, arrow, 
and this is in charge of counting up and passing, I don't know, timer number two, I guess. I might have to make a separate video on lambda expressions. Okay, let's try this again. So this should work. All right, there we go. So yeah, those are threads. A thread is an execution path of a program. We can use multiple threads to perform different tasks of our program at the same time. When we begin a program, we have one thread that is running and that is referred to as the main thread. So yeah, that's multi-threading in C-sharp. If you would like a copy of this code, I will post this to the comment section down below. And well, yeah, that's multi-threading in C-sharp. Hey you, yeah, I'm talking to you. If you learned something new, then help me help you in three easy steps by smashing that like button, drop a comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro.